to the February 5th Durango City Council meeting. May we have a roll call, please? Councilor Bettine? Here. Councilor Brookie? Here. Councilor White? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Here. Mayor Marbury? Here. And the first item on the uh, agenda is a proclamation celebrating Max Bear Day. And I'll go to the podium. I'd like to invite uh, the following gentlemen to come to the podium to accept it. Richard Elliott from Durango Cyclery and Max Be uh, Bechtold, please come to the podium and join me. Right over here. Uh, Max Bear Day. Whereas Max Bear, world heavyweight champion boxer and film star, known as the Butcher Boy, became a bright light on the otherwise drab face of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And whereas three brothers of the original Colorado family, namesake Marks, Ed, and Jacob Bear, chose to make Durango and this railroad destination their home. First in 1902 through 1922, and whereas father and former boxer Jacob Bear became a champion butcher and supervisor of the Durango Packing Company owned by the Graydon Mercantile Company. And whereas Max Bear attended elementary school in Durango and his boyhood home is now occupied by Durango Cypher at 143 East 13th Street. And whereas Max Bear's birthday was February the 11th, 1909, now, therefore, I, Sweetie Marbury, Mayor of Durango, do hereby proclaim February the 11th, 2019, as Max Bear Day. And thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are done. Let's go. Uh, yes, in fact, our director, our library director, Sandy Irwin, is here to talk about the program. And the book signing. So, Sandy, would you please come? Thank you I'll so much for attending. I'll stand right here with you guys for a moment so they can hear me on the microphone. But uh, so, the same day that is Max Bear Day, which is February 11th, is also the day that the authors, uh, Colleen Acox and Dave Wallace, will be at the library at 6 o'clock to talk about their research into Max Bear's life. And um, it should be a great, fun event, and we're really looking forward to having them here. Um, I did help with a little bit of research on the book about the time the Spanish flu affected their family. So take a look at the book, stop by on Monday night, and enjoy Max Bear Day, and I'll leave some flyers here if anybody wants to take some. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. You, you got to meet this cool lady. She's the one that roped us into it. <laughs> and she's amazing. She's an amazing story all by herself. So it'll be a great show. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Is anyone here from the Colorado High School Ski State Championship? Well, uh, as the mayor, I'm going to be doing a welcome to Durango at Fort Lewis on February the 20, let me find out, 22nd, I believe, welcoming all of the state champions uh, in the ski and we're so happy to have them come to our, our town, all of their families and uh, the high school students. Right now we're going to go to a, re a review of the consent agenda. The consent agenda is allowed to uh, allow the city council by a single motion to approve matters that are considered routine or non-controversial. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests an item be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Items removed from the consent agenda will be considered under agenda item number six. Ms. Phillips? Item 4.1 through 4.3 are approval of minutes. 4.1, the regular meeting of January 15, 2019. 4.2, the study session of January 8, 2019. And 4.3, the special study session of January 15, 2019. Items 4.4 through 4.8 are discussion and possible action items. 4.4 concerns resolution R 2019-4, authorizing an additional appropriation to the Capital Projects Fund for the Animus River Trail Asphalt Repair Project. 4.5 concerns resolution R 2019-5, authorizing an additional appropriation to the Sewer Capital Projects Fund and the Water Capital Projects Fund. 4.6 concerns resolution R 2019-6, authorizing an additional appropriation to the general fund 
for the Internet Crimes Against Children grant. 4.7 concerns resolution R-2019-7, authorizing an additional appropriation to the general fund for the Peace Officer Standard Training Post Grant. 4.8 concerns resolution R-2019-8, authorizing additional appropriation to the general fund for the Community Development <coughs> Block Grant 19-047. Items 4.9 through 4.11 are requests for public hearings with a proposed date of February 19, 2019. 4.9 is to consider the Cactus Rock Condominiums Condominium Flat Vacation. 4.10 is to consider a request from GRBP LLC for a preliminary plan flat for Lot 62 of Three Springs Village 1, Filing 4. 4.11 is to consider land use and development code text amendments to update the sign code. And items 4.12 through 4.14 are final approval of ordinances. 4.12 is ordinance 0 3 amending chapter 15 of the code <coughs> ordinances of the city of Durango concerning court cost, imposition of surcharge, assess in municipal court, compensation, and declaring an effective date. 4.13 is Ordinance 0 4 amending Section 25-134 of Article 4 of Chapter 25 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Durango, for purposes of modifying the requirements for qualifications under the Utility Refund Program and declaring an effective date. And Item 4.14 is Ordinance 0 5 amending Section 23-72 of Article 2 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Durango, for purposes of modifying the requirements for qualifications under the food tax rebate program and declaring an effective date. Thank you. Would any city councilor like to remove an item? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Uh, roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councilor Patin? Yes. Councilor Brookie? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Mayor Marbury. Yes. We're moving into public participation, and um, the assistant city manager will be retrieving everyone who signed up to speak to the city council during public participation. And that would be on items that are currently not on the consent agenda uh, or on the agenda tonight. Public participation. In this section of the agenda, set aside for the public to provide comments or ask questions regarding items that do not otherwise appear on this agenda. City Council will not respond to questions from the dais usually. Citizens should address their comments directly to the City Council. Citizens wishing to speak during this section of the agenda have signed in prior to the start of the meeting with their name and their address on the form provided at the meeting. Citizens are called individual, <laughs> individually by the mayor to come to the podium to address the council. You're limited to three minutes. The assistant city manager will signal 30 seconds remaining by raising her hand, and any audio visual materials must be provided to the city clerk on or before the day of noon. And uh, Chance Salway, Ch Chance, please come to the podium over there and address the council. Thank you very much, Mayor Sweetie. Um, so my name is Chad Salway, and I am the student body president at Fort Lewis College. Uh, Mayor Sweetie uh, convinced me to come up and participate during public participation. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself, as well as the, the fine senators that we do also have in attendance, as well as Mark Mostowski, our uh, advisor. Um, and just wanted to introduce myself and let you know we are keeping tabs and making sure uh, to pay attention to city ongoings. and. Uh, uh, look forward to watching the rest of the meeting. So. Well, thank you all for attending tonight, all the senators taking their valuable time to come to City Council. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Kim Baxter. <coughs> Hi, Kim Baxter, 1393 East 3rd Avenue. City staff has done an excellent job of recognizing that the city has a wicked problem and um, explaining that if things don't change, uh, expenses will continue rising faster than revenue growth. So the city council's solution to that has been to increase the sales tax rate uh, rather than to look at managing expenses or working to fix our tax base. Um, 
What's been missing from this conversation, unfortunately, is a second wicked problem. And that second wicked problem is one for the uh, residents of Durango, which is that Durango has become increasingly unaffordable over the last few years. Um, in Durango, housing costs have gone up 25% in the last five years. City services have gone up over 25% in the last five years. And healthcare costs have gone up 50 to 100% over the last five years. So in that time, um, me, uh, real income has only increased 5% in that same time. So our, city, our residents are feeling um, a lot of pressure on their expenses and managing their monthly expenses. The city um, has no impact, of course, on health care costs. That's a much bigger problem than we can begin to, to uh, uh, approach. And the city staff and city have made efforts to implement programs that will affect affordable housing that could have some impact on those. Um, uh, to date, the activities, because they're relatively new, have not yet had measurable impact on housing affordability. Um, every household in Durango is challenged to make, by making hard choices on how they manage their monthly expenses. And I believe that the city residents expect our city to do the same, um, to manage their expenses. So in trying to solve the city's wicked problem by raising taxes rather than managing expenses, the city has made the residents' wicked problem worse, making it less affordable to live here in the city. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Bloomquist. Good evening, Lisa Bloom, Chris Palmer, 3202 East 6th Avenue, Durango. I'm here as the executive director for Homes Fund, um, a nonprofit organization where we uh, try to address some of the problems that um, uh, Ms. Baxter just mentioned of housing affordability. We um, we have a home ownership assistance program where we are providing um, mortgage and down payment assistance to cover that gap between the low wages and the high cost and the high and ever increasing cost of housing in our in our community. I came up today in particular to thank the city and to thank the city council for the support of this of the community development block grant 19-047. That money um, will be going through the city, through homes fund into our community to help low and moderate income people to obtain home ownership. A couple of examples of the people who have used our program. Uh, most most recently, a, a gentleman who's a single father um, and, a man, and a manager at one of our local grocery stores was able to, to purchase a, a home with Homes Fund Assistance. Prior to that, um, a starting off engineer was actually under our, in, under our income limits and was able to buy a home here in, in the city limits of Durango. We've got restaurant managers, we've got a, a, administrative assistants. We've got um, people who who work in, um, we've got wildland firefighters, um, people who work at Mercy Medical Center, people who work at Stone Age, people who work at all of our key employers who would not otherwise be able to purchase a home in our community if not for the Home Spend Program. So um, thank you very much for all of your support. Um, I am going to be presenting fairly shortly, uh, I believe at the next study session, if not the next one, the one after that, information about the Fair Share Program where we could go into a little bit more detail. But if I do have time, I'd like to just give a couple of statistics. Um, it, within the city of Durango, Home Spend has lent uh, mortgage assistance to 67 households. The total amount of that mortgage assistance is $2.2 million, and that has leveraged more than $16.5 million in, in home purchases. The average home, home price of those who purchase with Home Spend assistance is a little bit shy of $250,000. 43 of the 67 loans are still outstanding. This is a revolving loan fund, and so as people refinance or sell or move on in life, they repay us, and then we relend the money out into the community. Something that we are particularly proud of is that we have, have had essentially zero losses. We've had zero losses within the city limits. There was one, there was one short sale um, a long time ago, but that's a 0.005% loss rate, and we're very proud of our stewardship of the money. So um, thank you all for your, for your ongoing support. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Anne Marie? We practice. Let's see. 
I ask Anne Marie to come tonight. She is from Adaptive Sports. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for having me. My name is Anne Marie Megan, and I'm the Executive Director at the Adaptive Sports Association. And um, a little bit about our organization. We've been around for the last 35 years, and we're a year-round program dedicated to providing life-changing outdoor recreational experiences to people with disabilities. We work with kids and adults, um, and we're primarily volunteer-based. So we have over 300 volunteers that are active in our organization, and last year they gave over 17,000 hours of their time in uh, direct program service. <coughs> During the winter, we're a ski and snowboard school up at Purgatory Resort. If you've been up to Purgatory, you may have seen us in our red coats uh, all over the mountain. Last year, we taught about 900 lessons uh, to almost 300 individuals, and our folks come from all over. So we have a strong local and regional program, as well as we serve tourists who choose Durango as their family destination, oftentimes because of adaptive sports. Just a few photos of the fun different pieces of equipment that we use to make uh, skiing and snowboarding accessible to everyone. During the summer, we uh, do all sorts of programs. We raft, canoe, kayak, cycle. Uh, we do water skiing, camping, climbing. Um, and we do some overnight multi-day programs. And so really those are the programs that have grown over the last few years. And uh, many of them are specific for military veterans, both local and folks who are coming from around uh, the nation to participate with us. A couple photos of our summer program. And then the big uh, event for us at the end of this month is the Dave Spencer Ski Classic. And this is our largest fundraising event of the year. It's a blast, as you can see from the photos. Teams of five get together, dress up in costume, and participate in a fun race on Saturday up at the Purgatory Paradise Race Arena. It's not a serious race. It's uh, all about your predicted time. We give out awards for best costume, biggest wipeout, most uh, dollars raised. And then on Sunday, we do a poker run and a uh, mountain rally around, around the mountain, and we finish off with a big awards party to celebrate uh, funds raised, as well as the athletes that are participating with us, as well as the community. And so we're looking for people to get involved. Um, teams of five, you can join as a free agent if you uh, don't have a team, or you can sponsor an athlete or a team, Counselor Patine and uh, Durango Land at Homes is sponsoring a group of five adaptive athletes. So there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. And thank you for that. We're excited. So I hope to see people on the mountain. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mindy Nelson. Hi, I'm Mindy Nelson, 26072 Highway 160. And I'm here tonight from the January 15th City Council regular meeting. There's a couple of points I'd like to clarify. On January 15th, Mr. Hall stated that the county adopted a climate energy action plan a few years back. And that would allow the sustainable fee to be pushed into the residents outside of Durango. From the articles I found, the, the plan was killed on March 15, 2012 by the county commissioners. Now that the city council understands how this is being implemented at the county level, plus of the false information, it should go for a revote, don't you think? And then on the second point, Mr. LeBlanc commented that the Durango has many state organizations. Does Durango citizens know that their tax dollars are being, being are, tax dollars are paying for the a global group called International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, commonly referred to as ICLE? How does this benefit a little town like Durango? Why are we answering to them? ICLE is not a statutory law; it's a soft law from the European Nation Union. It provides community plans, software, trainings, and to drive the process of Agenda 21. This international membership by cities and counties violates Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution. No state shall enter any treaty, alliance, or confederation with a foreign power. These are my concerns today, and I, 
like to have some sort of a response at some point. So I came with the articles that I found from the past and would like to present them for y'all to look at. Well, I can, uh, I can certainly give you some information, and so can Councillor White. Um, the county commissioners did not kill the sustainability fee. They had asked us to consider, but uh, we passed it on, on, I'm not sure what the date, uh, oh. we passed it. Uh, so that, that's the incorrect information. You passed the sustainable fee, mm -hmm. but the, yes. the climate action plan I want to have Councillor White. Was never adopted. The climate action plan was submitted by the group that uh, developed it over a two-year period with support from both the city and the county. It was submitted to both the city council, which accepted it and pledged timely consideration of its recommendations, not all of which have happened. Uh, and, but the and during, owing to an intervening election, the Board of County Commissioners chose not to accept the report. Uh, they did not kill it. The report is there uh, for reference by the City Council, and I believe we have a study session coming up in a couple of weeks when um, discussion of some of the recommendations in that plan will in fact uh, come forward. Um, climate change, which is what the plan was about, is, as you probably read in the news, scientifically a major issue. And the scientific community across the world has uh, very strongly, I believe the percentage from one study was 97% of climate scientists uh, under, agree that human cause, humankind is causing climate change. It is incumbent on everyone to begin to address this problem. It is a major goal of the city council, articulated uh, repeatedly in our uh, annual retreats, that that is one of our major goals. Membership in ICLEI contributes to contributes resources that will help our community address this issue that is affecting everyone. Uh, I stand by what we've done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And that concludes the public participation. We are moving into uh, legislative and policy related hearings. 8.1.1 is a public hearing and possible amendments to the city code regarding camping, sheltering, trespass, and other provisions related to the use and occupancy of parks, open space, rights of way, and other public and private property. Uh, Ms. Um, would you look for comments down there? And I will open that up for the uh, for the staff. Um, Did anyone sign up to address that? Yes. No. For the the zip. About camping for the camping. Oh, camping. For uh, eight point one point one, it's on sheltering oh, trespass. Sorry, I have the wrong number. Go ahead. Okay, well, we're going to have this, if you'll bring that to me, thank you. We'll have the staff present the information. Madam Mayor, I'll make a, a presentation based on the agenda documentation uh, that you have tonight. This agenda documentation is essentially the same as what you had uh, presented to you uh, during a study session uh, in November. Uh, due to the holidays and other uh, events, we uh, had postponed the hearing from that date, but really hasn't been much change in uh, what's you know, proposed in, this, in the documents tonight uh, from that study session. Uh, and I think it's, I believe it's fair to say that uh, the changes that we proposed are really more clarifications uh, and updates to the code, definition changes and so forth, and probably will have very little if any change in the current operations regarding uh, enforcement of camping and sheltering uh, in and around the city. And it's our intent to adopt regulations and to impose uh, uh, some uh, <clears throat> efforts to enforce those uh, in a manner that's entirely consistent with the provisions of the Boise case that was decided uh, by the Ninth Circuit Court or uh, a three panel judge panel of the Ninth Circuit uh, back in September of 18. So I'll kind of uh, try to run through the agenda doc to give the highlights for those. Uh, maybe just to refresh uh, everyone on, on what we're discussing. 
uh, following the issuance of the Boise case, as I mentioned, um, the city agreed to uh, place a moratorium on enforcement of uh, uh, sheltering in the open space between the periods of sunset and sunrise of each day, or sunrise, yeah, sunset and sunrise of each day. Um, as part of that process, we understood that uh, the code needed some updating and some uh, uh, changes. So it was all. It has always been our intent to to come back to council with the changes that are being suggested in this document. Uh, the temporary suspension of enforcement in the, of the camping in the open space uh, and sheltering in the open space doesn't didn't in any way impact the city's ability to enforce uh, other limitations on activities in those areas, uh, particularly those that protect the health, safety, and welfare of those in the open space, so staying in the open space, and other people using the open space. And those items are things like uses of stoves or fires. We're all very aware, obviously, of the fire danger. Uh, we have had some moisture, but unfortunately, we're not out of the woods in terms of fire danger. Uh, items such as, um, such as smoking in the open space, uh, sanitary health concerns, uh, fighting, interfering with the use of public property by others, alcohol and illegal substances, you know, those kind of offenses still uh, are, <coughs> are, enforcing, are, enfo are enforced and are enforced. Um, so at the study session on November 13th, the council uh, discussed these options and um, a variety of uh, items which I'll run through in some detail in a second. So one of the things that's proposed right now, the current code uh, does not contain a definition of camping, although there are restrictions in the code on camping. There was, it was not clear uh, what, that code, what that term meant. So <clears throat> after I've done a great deal of research, uh, by other municipalities in the area and really across the nation uh, proposed a camping definition and I'll read it just because I think it helps to to read it actually out loud. Uh, camping means the temporary use or occupancy of a location for the purposes of a living, a living accommodation. The following activities or actions shall be considered in determining whether a person is camped or is camping as described in this section. A, sleeping or making preparations for sleep in the location, including the use of bedding or other articles to assist in sleeping with or without cover. B, the presence or use of any item or cover that serves as or is intended to help protect the person from the weather or other elements, including the use of any item other than clothing, including the use of a sleeping bag, blankets, tent, tarp, structure, or other material of any kind. C, the presence or use of a campfire, camp stove, or other heating source or cooking device and activities related to preparation of food or meals, the keeping or storing of personal property on or near the location, and the duration of the use, particularly a use that's longer than the period from sunset to sunrise. Uh, I think it's important to be, you know, this definition is not intended to, you know, to uh, impact, you know, picnicking or casual use of areas this really sort of gets at, and I think the key word here is a temporary use for purposes of a living accommodation. It's that domiciliary kind of use. So again, our moratorium, uh, and I think the Boise case, uh, consistently with the Boise case, um, it, it focuses on the concept of sheltering. That means, uh, you know, uh, by the definition that's being proposed, you know, sheltering would be effectively a use of an area uh, for a period of really overnight, uh, from sundown to sunrise the next day, um, with or without use of cover or other protection. So our, our agreement for the moratorium of the use of the open space, and I think the requirement of the Boise case, is that sheltering be uh, be uh, allowed if there's not other if indoor sheltering is not otherwise allowed during those kinds of periods. So uh, again, we'll, we're proposing that sort of sh definition of sheltering in the code. Uh, I thought it was helpful to actually sort of go through and try to address all the properties, the types of property in the city, <coughs> and, <coughs> and address uses as for camping and for sheltering based on those definitions on each kind of property. So I'll, I will move through each of those. The first uh, identified type of property is what we will call the developed parks. I think I referred to them earlier as green parks. These are parks you know, that, uh, and there's a list of those parks in the agenda documentation that was prepared by the Parks and Rec Department. 
The current rule on those kind of developed parks is that there's a curfew that prevents anyone for any reason being in the park from uh, midnight to 5 a.m. of each day. So the proposal is to continue to uh, keep that curfew in place. The curfew will apply to the parks that are listed, to the parking areas immediately adjacent to those uh, uh, parks, uh, and that no camping or overnight sheltering be allowed uh, in those parks at any time. Those are, the, again, the typical kind of developed parks, the playground equipment, and those sorts of things. Again, incidental napping or resting and picnicking during the times when the parks are open uh, will be allowed, and that's the, the normal purpose of the park. Second uh, area is the Animus River Trail and the city-owned property along the trail. Because the trail gets used at all hours of the day and night, uh, the curfew does not apply to that area, but still the proposal is to have no camping or sheltering uh, in those areas along the trail. Um, at any time, again, incidental napping, resting, picnicking, those kinds of things are perfectly acceptable as long as they don't you know, violate any other health and safety provisions as long as they don't interfere with the use of those areas. Uh, open space and trails, again, this is the area where uh, the city had agreed to temporarily suspend any enforcement of sheltering rules. Um, there would be, uh, but but the proposal is, and the agreement was, that we wouldn't allow any camping. In other words, you, there wouldn't be any ability to set up that longer term use or that domiciliary kind of use. So um, currently, sheltering from the hours of sunset to sunrise uh, are allowed. The proposal is to continue that process, but to, to delegate the authority to designate areas on a, on a, uh, for sheltering you know, by the city manager um, if adequate sh sheltering is not otherwise available in the city under the provisions of the Boise case. So that the proposal is that that will be done uh, by the city manager in consultation with staff uh, with other uh, and with the advisory boards that oversee those properties and in consultation with other interested parties including the public and so forth. Uh, that process will probably take some time to get in, you know to get moving but in the in the interim the proposal is to leave the um, agreed uh, moratorium in place until there be, can be some more definition of some specific areas, uh, again, using that process that I just described. Uh, another category, the next category is um, hard surface trails, uh, Gigline Gold's Trail, for instance, Three Springs Trail, the recreational areas. Um, I, the agenda documentation actually refers to Night Horse here, but if you look at the list of the parks that were listed for to be subject to the curfew, Night Horse is listed. The city has agreement with the Bureau of Reclamation that there would be no camping in Night Horse. Uh, there's a, a good deal of sensitive area there, a lot of uh, cultural resources that could be disturbed. So that's clearly an area that camping is not, is not appropriate uh, at this point. So again, uh, other hard surface trails, no camping or sheltering, incidental napping along those trails, picnicking and so forth is also allowed. Again, with, this, with the same provisions that they meet health and safety codes and that they don't interfere with the other uses. Uh, City-owned buildings and surrounding grounds. Um, again, no camping or sheltering allowed on building grounds. That would be like the library, for instance, the grounds around the library. Um, the current uh, uh, provision, or, you know, that's, that's actually enforced by city staff is that incidental napping or resting is allowed inside city buildings that are open to the public that would be like the library, transit center, rec center, provided that they, they're not like laying on the floor or laying on the furniture, uh, or that they're not disturbing other occupants. So this is consistent with the current uh, process. So there are other properties, airport parking lots, uh, regular parking lots, grounds not open to the public, like this building or the parking lot here, that kind of thing. And again, the, no camping or sheltering is allowed you know, in those areas. Uh, street sidewalks and right away for obvious reasons, obvious safety reasons, there would be no camping or sheltering allowed in those areas. Uh, that those kind of uses would be uh, incredibly dangerous for both people who are using those in cars and so forth, and for people who might be occupying those areas. So um, the last item that was discussed at the study session was some changes in some rules, or maybe clarification of some rules on the use of RVs, travel trailers, vans, boats, campers, and other converted commercial 
vehicles such as panel vans, red trucks, school buses uh, in the right of way or the city property for uh, the purposes of living or sleeping. Um, council uh, gave staff direction that uh, you were interested in putting in some rules uh, that because those kinds of uses uh, tend to be uh, very visible and they take up more uh, space uh, in, uh, in the neighborhoods. They tend not to move around uh, as often as cars do. So the proposal for those kinds of things uh, would be that, uh, that we would prohibit camping, sheltering, or sleeping in RVs, the bigger vehicles, RVs, travel trailers, again, vans, converted you know, commercial vehicles, we'll have, you know, be careful about the definitions, but uh, that that would not be allowed on any city right of way or the city uh, owned public property, including city parking lots. Currently, there's no camping and parking lots, city parking lots allowed, so there's no, not any significant change there. Um, so the current rules also limit unauthorized parking or occupancy of uh, motor RVs and other similar vehicles on private property. Uh, so again, the LUDC currently prohibits those uh, on private property as it stands at this point. Just to be clear, this provision as suggested does not specifically prohibit sleeping in an automobile um, because they tend to move around. Uh, we, we've had discussions with the police department and with code enforcement. The idea is that those, those do tend to move around um, on a daily basis and aren't as significant an impact to the neighborhood. So the current proposal is that again, large vehicles be prohibited for occupancy, for sleeping, automobiles um, would not be. So a typical passenger automobile would not be included in that definition. Thank That's you. Uh, there's been some question about the number of tickets that have been issued, and so Chief Reimer, I'm gonna call you up please to address, the, to give the correct information. <clears throat> Thank you. Madam Mayor, Councilors, I'm Bob Brammer. I'm your uh, commander. I'm the interim chief of police right now for the Green Police Department. Uh, so there was a report that was filed uh, labeled a year without sleep, and that was filed this fall. And in that report, it was cited from August 2017 to July of 18, the number of tickets that the regular police department issued um, in regards to trespassing that may have had the word sleep involved into it. So the report stated there was 98 tickets. There was five of those tickets that were cited specifically within that report, and we just want to give some clarification on that uh, because the way they documented that within that report was saying that it was, it was targeted acts of they were sleeping, 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 and that's what we that's what we ticketed for. Um, on each one of those occasions, each one of those people were sleeping, but there was underlying behaviors that were involved with the initial, either the initial contact or part of the contact that was determined based off of the totality of the circumstances. So uh, police officers by nature are curious. That's why most of them, if they are curious, they're very good at their job because they look for suspicious activities and they investigate those to figure out if it's criminal or if it's normal or whatever the case may be. But we definitely look for some suspicious activity. Uh, one of these uh, activities was on the inner block of Rusa. There was a motorcycle that was partially obscured. It was parked inside uh, of the bushes. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. The officer went and contacted it because it was just, it didn't look right. So he was trying to figure out what it was. In the course of investigating that motorcycle that was parked there, he found somebody sleeping. He contacted him, that person owned that motorcycle. And that person was found to be um, habitually revoked uh, with the driver's license. And he was subsequently cited for trespassing. So he was sleeping at the time of the contact. Uh, the next one that uh, we had was um, the 100 block of college. Uh, when the officer was driving through about 3 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and he found a, uh, two people sleeping next to a grocery cart. So he went and checked them out. At that time, there was multiple open containers that were next to him, and they were intoxicated. So he wrote for open container and trespassing because it was in a public area. Um, and then there was another one that we had where two offenders were in a city parking lot. Um, again, this was early in the morning. The windows were obscured by blankets. Uh, there was clothing on the ground. He again made a suspicious contact on that, found two people sleeping inside that car. And so he took them for trespassing for being inside the, uh, inside the city parking lot. Uh, we had another one that was a Buckley Park. This was in the afternoon. Um, in the course of that investigation, we were dispatched to a call of a man that was in the park. Uh, he was intoxicated. The officer contacted him, told him to move along. Um, he did not. The officer had to respond to another call, came back, checked on him. He was still there. He was set up for trespassing. 
Uh, the last one that was referenced was in the 100 block of 9th Street. Again, it was early in the morning. The officer contacted a vehicle that was parked in the 2 to 5 area. So we prohibit parking downtown from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. for street maintenance. He contacted that vehicle, that gentleman was sleeping in the car, he took it in for trespassing at that point, and then he moved on. So that was just the uh, five of the 98 that were cited, and that just gives a little bit of clarification because there were some underlying issues that were associated to each one of those contacts. Thank you very much. I appreciate the information. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to open the public testimony, and we have Lynn Schaller. Please come to the podium and uh, tell us your address, please. Hi there, thank you. I'm Lynn Schaller. My address is 1099 Main Avenue, number 409 in Toronto. I'm a civil rights attorney and a member of the Indivisible Civil Rights Committee. So I'm here today disheartened uh, to hear that, you're, that the city is uh, operating business as usual with the camping ban um, in this civil and humanitarian crisis especially after the two letters you received from the ACLU National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, um, one in November, and then the, the um, event that was held by those joint entities in mid-December, where some 150 people of the community showed up uh, to discuss and uh, create solutions for the homelessness problem. So um, this ordinance, is as unrealistic as it is inhumane. It's impossible for the homeless people to pack up their tents and all their possessions, especially in the winter when they need lots of blankets and uh, tarps to get the water and the snow off of them, especially when we've had so much snow and rain as we have lately. Their tents get wet, they can't just fold them up, they get moldy and they get ruined. So and it's extremely difficult for them to put everything that they own on their back especially for the aged and the disabled. So um, in light of the uh, legal authority that is provided to you from the ACLU and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, um, I think the cost of potential litigation by those entities would not be deemed a good use of funds by the citizens of this community, especially when there's been so much talk about budget challenges. Um, there are some simple solutions that other cities have implemented, including the RV and large vehicle people. Uh, at least those people are lucky to have a vehicle that they could find shelter in to protect them from the weather and animals, theft, and violence. And so some cities have opened up a parking lot. Perhaps you could use the parking lot in between the rec center and the fairgrounds in the evenings and open that up to RVs and, and vans and these other vehicles that you're trying to ban pretty much out of sight, but you can put a porta potty there, hire a security guard for a nominal amount of money and they could have Wi-Fi access and be able to sleep without being harassed. Um, other entities have uh, opened up emergency shelters. As you know, we've had a pretty wet winter with temperatures that went down to below 15, below zero. Um, and that makes it an issue of survival for people. So I would ask that you um, first identify where the people can camp. I had heard a very extensive list about all the places that they can't uh, shelter, but I have not heard where they are allowed to shelter. And I guess my request is that you pivot and work on emergency and permanent housing rather than uh, just uh, telling people what they can't do. And let's look at actually, actually trying to solve homelessness instead of criminalizing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. No one else has signed up. Um, <coughs> let's see. Did, um, any response, Mr. Nelson? Well, I would say, as I said earlier, that the intent is to be in full compliance with uh, the provisions of the Boise case that we're currently operating under that provides for shelter. It is our intent to allow sheltering in certain areas of the open space. Right now, sheltering is allowed in the open space. Um, so there will be a designation of some areas. Uh, that's yet to be determined, but that's, this sets up a process to allow that to occur. Uh, so, and I, and I think that, you know, I, I don't think anyone disagrees that we need additional shelter in the city. Uh, so I don't think that, that the, the 
effort to create shelter, find shelter, uh, is inconsistent with uh, trying to, to place some um, regulations on the use of the public property. Now, the Boise case is clear uh, that sheltering uh, is, uh, you know, a necessary item, and you know, and again, we're, we're providing for that. The sheltering does not have to be provided by the city. In this case, we're proposing that it will be. Uh, city staff continues to work with a group, nonprofit groups, uh, Access Health, uh, the county, other entities to try to secure uh, some sheltering, some more permanent sheltering opportunities. I think everyone sees this as a temporary solution. <clears throat> I don't think anyone sees that that staying in the you know sheltering in the open, sheltering in the parks, in the you know in the mountain parks, uh, is a a good long-term solution. It is not. Uh, but in the interim, uh, this is the proposal that again meets uh, I, you know I think meets the the, the provisions of the Boise case. Uh, I think it's up to council to decide you know, what sort of uh, regulations you want to adopt. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to close the public testimony and uh, comments from city council. I have a couple questions, yes. if I may. Um, Mr. Nelson, I just want to clarify a couple parts of the uh, ordinance here. Uh, to my understanding, after I was reading them, one was with respect to sort of the camper van terminology there. Mm -hmm. um, the language in there is converted commercial vehicles. And then it kind of defines them like the bread truck and the school bus and so forth. Um, and I was just curious if you felt that that converted commercial vehicles language was broad enough so that if there was some other kind of vehicle that the, the city had the authority to designate that that truly was a converted commercial vehicle, or should that language be broader? Well, I'm open to suggestions on things we missed. I think that, I think the idea is that what would be allowed would be your typical passenger vehicle. Um, I think the, the fuzzy area that I saw would be maybe like uh, converted vans. So that would be a commercial size van, so we may be able to define vehicle weight or, you know, that sort of thing. But like a minivan versus a plumber's van, for instance, that's the kind of distinction I think that could be a little bit fuzzy. I did discuss with the uh, chief a little bit about enforcement, and I think that there may be some fine tuning, but I think it will, I, I hope we can make it clear the distinction between something that's larger than your average family vehicle of, you know, an individual uh, uh, automobile versus something that's larger. And I think that that's it, there isn't there isn't necessarily going to be, and I'm sure there will be things that we haven't thought of, uh, but the general distinction, I think, I hope will be clear enough that in case someone gets cited, um, you know, that, that, that it'll be clear. I, I will also say, I think that, I don't think there's going to be a rush, and I, and I didn't specifically talk to the chief about this, but you know, this is going to be a phased thing, I think, in terms of, we're not going to rush out and start writing tickets for everybody, um, but so hopefully there's some education involved. Um, you know, I think a lot of this is going to be, I'm sure, going to be complaint-based. Uh, so it will be driven by some opportunities to help, we hope, enforce in ways that aren't heavy-handed, particularly to begin with. So we may need to come back and fine-tune that, but that's the intent. And I hope that helps. Well, yeah, I, I, I apologize for not, for that not occurring to me before, but I guess I might just suggest if it does, uh, pass this evening that maybe there's a look at that and make sure that we're not, you know, having to discern between various other types of commercial vehicles and that it is broad enough. That was just one, one thought that occurred to me right. recently. Um, and then one other question I had, be, because the issue that Ms. Scholler brought up and we've heard many, many, many times from testimony in the public and certainly from the folks that are most affected um, relative to the having to pack up and move belongings, and you, you actually included that in the, the language. And I just wanted to ask you about uh, pathways that the city council and or city manager may have should we, when we get to the point after the moratorium is through and perhaps we designate space, is there a pathway that we have within the construct of this ordinance that we could perhaps modify that if it made sense to? And I would also, uh, relate things like the time of day, you know, because that's another thing that came up. Uh, 
is this restricting in a way that we wouldn't have the ability to do that or if we were doing an emergency ordinance uh, i think you would probably take further council action because this definition is proposed to be what would be in the ordinance again it's up to you what this is just suggestions in terms of process but I, certainly uh this is not going to be cast concrete in a way that it couldn't ever be modified um if indeed council decides that you wanted to allow something other than just sheltering as we've defined it here which would mean allowing people to leave up tents in certain areas for instance i think it's, it's certainly uh a, a non-difficult process to go in and amend it um, i think that that would probably result from some staff uh, recommendation i would think in terms of uh some positive again what I, what I see happening here uh is that the city manager will undertake over the next say a couple months before uh the fire season really cranks up because i think that that is one of the biggest concerns as fire issues particularly on the you know in the mountain parks around the city try to designate some areas that we think that he thinks uh, based on input from staff and other people that can be safely occupied that are accessible uh, and there may be some of those areas that are more, more defined uh, that would allow for some other kinds of uses. Again, I think that's entirely up to council if you want to modify it. Again, I hope that answered your question. No, question. it does. Thank you. And um, if I may, just a couple more points, Mayor, is that okay? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I just wanted to reemphasize what you said in your presentation relative to the impacts of the potential of passing something like this or asking you to write the ordinance in that there is currently a moratorium in place there will still be a moratorium in place this does not actually go into effect and it's not policed from this day forward until right. the city manager has an opportunity to designate a a place based on um the opportunities that 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 person is given within the construct of this so um really doesn't create any change today my understanding sure. and uh, but it does further define what it means to camp and or uh, shelter in the community uh, and also want to reemphasize something else you said which was that the city is working closely with the county today uh, uh, regularly they regularly schedule meetings to try to work with uh, health and human services organizations within the county's uh, purview uh, to uh, both enact a strategic plan relative to long-term successes in the community uh, towards this issue um, and this, the council is actually with the the county commissioners uh, designated some funding for that in this uh, in this year. So we uh, we continue to look for that opportunity uh, and the place and, and all the all the uh, solutions that are available, as well as designating place for long term supportive housing through housing solutions in our community. That is in process, as I understand it. Now they're trying to obtain funding to actually build the bricks and mortar type of facility that would be. Uh, more appropriate for all of the folks that would have to um, have a homeless situation. And so those things are on ongoing. There is not a, a stop in this. We have directed the staff uh, to have a upcoming study session so that we can really understand where we're at with some of the progress on some of those issues. And, uh, and certainly some of the things that Ms. Scholler brought up uh, will be part of those discussions. Uh, and uh, although you use the word simple solutions, I have found this to be the least simple um, process that we've ever undertaken in my tenure here. But I just want to assure the community that we are still working very hard on it on a regular basis. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Do you guys have any? Well, I, I'll, I'll uh, reinforce what uh, Councilor Patin just said in terms of the, you know, it's not that the city is doing nothing. We are actually have historically and, and continue to look for that long, uh, long term solution, which in my mind is bricks and mortar uh, shelter. And uh, to Ms. Schiller's comments, you know, I, I, I personally feel that's one of the most, most inhumane uh, actions that we can take as a, as a municipality to sanction any permanent outside domicile in the form of camping, sanctioning a campsite uh, to send the very population that you mentioned, elderly, disabled, to send them up on the side of a mountain to camp in 20 degree temperature, in my mind is inhumane. And I'm not willing to vote for anything that would result in that uh, long-term sanctioning by this community. Uh, so 
you know, all of us, uh, as, as uh, Chris has mentioned, have, have the desirous result here is to have a long-term shelter. <coughs> we do, for I think a one dollar a year lease, uh, offer the VOA shelter, which is a number of beds that current has been in existence for a number of years. Um, we, for one dollar at least, uh, uh, allow Mana Soup Kitchen to exist. Uh, we've got uh, one dollar a year for housing solutions. One dollar a year for housing solutions for their existing and their ultimate, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, new development for permanent supportive housing that uh, we've been waiting for for uh, at least over a year and a half now, but is a function of the state government that we've applied for. So. There are a number of things in progress, and so I think what this uh, action tonight would be is to provide clear definition between camping and shelter, which is camping establishes domicile, and if that if that occurs in our community, we've got a longer-term problem and a much more costly problem for every taxpayer in our community. So I think that's what the intent of this is to be, and. Uh, and the car camping or the vehicle camping of any sort does not target target the homeless population. This is a phenomenon that's occurring throughout our country. Uh, young people, old and retired people particularly, can't, uh, moving around a company in RVs and camping on streets, every public street. Do we want that in our community? Do we want to foster that? It's not a targeted as, uh, action towards the homeless, although the, that population is part of the overall picture. So I think that's a, a worthwhile uh, aspect of, of camping on our streets anywhere uh, in these recreational vehicles, campers and other types of boat motor vehicles that is, again, not targeted at the homeless population, but uh, does affect the safety and uh, enjoyability of our citizens in our community. So uh, I <coughs> fully support these code amendments and, and look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Mayor Project. From what I understand from um, our city attorney um, and discussions too, this is there's this is just there's this isn't presenting anything that we aren't already enforcing and doing today. So there's not, no new material here to me, with the exception of solidifying in black and white what it is to shelter and what it is to camp. Um, it's very important to me that currently we are not, as as Councillor Patine suggested, enforcing in the open space, um, and that. Um, through May, we will start to make some decisions as to where individuals can shelter and have those discussions. I think that our residents will want us to have those discussions and we've had some talks about having um, some of that discussion about where that might take place um, most safely for the residents of our community and to take into account neighborhoods um, and, 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 and safety um, issues. So in, in light of that, I just don't, I, I don't think that what we're presenting tonight is anything, anything new that we're currently doing today. Um, so if, um, whether we, um, if we have an issue with what we're currently doing today, then that should have been brought up quite some time ago because it is, it is what we have been enforcing. Councillor White? Yeah, uh, I have <coughs> two suggestions to make. Uh, I uh, made the suggestion in, uh, at our study session when we discussed this and that is that it seems to me that the sunset to sunrise time is excessively restrictive. That realistically it should be one to two hours at either end. Uh, and I believe I wasn't specific about that at the time, but I think at least an hour after, uh, an hour before sunset to an hour after sunrise would be a more, at a minimum, um, probably not more than two, because otherwise then you're starting to spill over into camping. But, um, you know, I think staff might re, you know, consider and discuss that among themselves before the uh, text of the ordinance is finalized. But I really think that that is a, um, is a desirable change. Um, Ms. Schaller's remarks uh, prompted me to wonder whether we might include in the vehicle section uh, an option for the city manager to designate a vehicle camping site in the same way that uh, our vehicle sheltering site, sorry about the, the, the stumble on the language, that a vehicle sheltering site um, option might be 
enabled by the ordinance so that we could go ahead and do that without necessarily having to come back to council for an amendment. But to, where would that be? I mean, we uh, have, well, we you have know, city property. Well, that's that's the issue, and is that a viable alternative? But the uh, you know the challenge for all of these issues is where uh, we've been struggling for two years to find uh, an appropriate place within the community that we might allow um, at least sheltering. Um, Councilor Brookie has very clearly nailed the issue on the concern with camping as establishing a domicile and then uh, essentially obligating the city in possibly in perpetuity to maintain such a, a use of property. That would require an entire uh, land use process by the city. And I think it is predictable that it would uh, achieve a great outcry from um, users of whatever piece of property we might decide. The challenge is that uh, property in Durango is expensive. Um, public property is relatively scarce. Uh, um, the, and this is, I don't believe that there are solutions. I believe I've said at other times, there are uh, no solutions and few options, most of which are bad, and maybe all of which are bad. Mm -hmm. Certainly what we're talking about here uh, with, with uh, individuals sheltering in open space in the middle of the winter is a bad outcome. But we have not been able to identify a, a better one that meets the needs of the entire community. Uh, if someone has such a solution, please come forward. We've been begging for this for about two years. I would comment, I, I would be looking for council input on uh, both of those ideas. I think, I, I certainly don't have any problem with sunset to sunrise with an hour either way. I think that that's certainly more reasonable. And that did come up in the study session. Uh, so I would be looking for input on that. The automobile section, we certainly could include that. Um, but I think that a lot of this, as Councilor Brookie pointed out, is not really driven by homeless as much as it is people who are, I mean, there are websites, I understand, who uh, they tout the lifestyle of living on the road and living well, on I the street. Well, I have concerns about that. Uh, so I think that that's an option, but I think that w w I would also just, re just uh, ask Council to, um, I, I know you're aware, but just as a reminder, there are legal places for people to camp mm -hmm. Uh, in you know in or around federal property for for periods of time uh, so I think that there are opportunities for people to stay I, I mean I think it literally you could drive you know in some places a mile or two or three or four or five from the city and they have a perfectly legal place to park uh, an RV an or, a, or a place to stay those options exist those yeah, options exist. exist yes do they exist um, in the winter I don't know that so much in the winter, but certainly when the snow, uh, and there's certainly are certain areas that get closed in the winter uh, because of wildlife and so forth, but. There's also RV uh, parks around. There are RV parks, but I think that for as far as people who don't want to pay, uh, there are places on the federal property that I think are. Well, we've had many complaints about RVs parked in neighborhoods, parked by city parks, parked by businesses. Um, I, I get all the emails and my council sees them about the complaints about I move it one block, I move it over here and it's still in a residential area. We saw that Walmart had the exact same problem uh, last December, I believe, where they had the school bus, they had the bread van, they had the RVs and they also had the San Juan Basin Health Department come and say they are dropping all of their um, I hate to say it, but they're potty on the pavement and they made Walmart step it up. Thank you, Walmart. I'm proud of you because now it's a cleaned up parking lot and we do have places for those RVs, not in our neighborhoods, not by our school and not by our parks. And so that is a real concern for me as a, a parent, a grandparent, and I've taken those phone calls and the, the complaints from the residents. and. The city the attorney knows I have been talking about this since last summer. Yes. So I am very happy to see that the RV provisions, the bread trucks, the school buses, anybody who's paid any attention has seen the school buses around town. 
and know exactly what's going on. There are RV parks. And if that's your style of life, well, great, you know? But go to the RV park, stay out of our parks, uh, our schools, and our neighborhoods. So I'm very happy with this. And I don't think it's up to the city manager to figure out their life if they are in an RV or a bread truck or a school bus. They obviously cannot, they obviously are moving, you know, or they're mobile and they have the funds to do that. I, I, I recall the, the uh, uh, Ms. Schiller's suggestion of the, uh, the fairground site, which is by the way, county property in its entirety, including the property underneath the city of Durango Rec Center. Uh, and that was a, a, a group consideration, both by the city and the county in a joint session. Uh, it was one of the one of the multiple sites that was considered and was pretty summarily rejected uh, by the county at that time and is presumed to be in conflict with the other functions and activities were go that would be continuously held at the at the on the county fairgrounds property uh, I think it was at that time it was envisioned as more of a shelter or a camp and not strictly vehicle limited to vehicle parking so no that's certainly something that i don't think is specifically regulated by this ordinance or precluded by this ordinance it would and might be a topic for further discussion when we have an opportunity to do that with the county mm -hmm. seeing it as their property yeah i don't i don't think we i don't think we need to amend this particular ordinance to sort of deal with a what is a completely separate issue of designating a place for uh, transient RVs to go, but it certainly could be a topic we address. I think the more pressing topic, obviously, in our community are people that don't have any shelter. And so um, really addressing that is our first priority, and we haven't really tackled the other one to be able to modify this in any way. I just don't think we have enough knowledge under our belts. However, I just wanted to say I am in support of what um, Councillor White said relative to the hours. I think okay. mm -hmm. that's a good amendment and I would support okay. that. And right. I think more reasonable. Okay. Right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. I have guidance, I think. So. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, this is a public hearing and I'll be looking for a decision then by the city council. I think the action would be to be make a motion to- uh, Approve the- the, uh, well, to direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance. So I'll begin that motion. Right. I, I'll, I'll make a motion to request the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending the city code of Durango regarding camping, sheltering, trespass, and other provisions related to the use and occupancy of parks, open space, rights of way, and other public and private property at the next regularly scheduled council meeting, taking into account the recommendations that have been offered this evening. Is there a second? I will second. Roll call, please. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving on to 8.1.2, a public hearing to consider land use and development code text amendments. And Ms. Vandegrift will be presenting. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, City Council. So this is another suite of our um, Land Use and Development Code text amendments that staff is bringing forward. Um, we're really addressing things that we found that are missing or that we want to encourage. Also some things that just are um, cleanups of the code. And so there's a number of them. I'll try to go through them pretty fast. So if you have questions, just feel free to interrupt me if you would like to while I'm going through. Um, the first is we're coming up with a new type of housing. It's called age-restricted age housing, and it means housing for persons 67 and above in one or two bedroom sized, in one or two bedroom sized units. Um, and then in two bedroom units, you can have an occupancy of up to two people. So again, it's trying to restrict the overall population. Um, senior con congregate housing is age-restricted units that have common shared facilities and that can will include a kitchen and dining area and possibly in a sitting area. And then one or more meals are prepared for the residents each day. So it's a little bit more care than you have in, in totally independent age restricted units, uh, but not to the level of care that you have in assisted care facility. So we're trying to fill kind of that um, niche with this definition. 
Um, there are different types of congregate housing. We're looking at like in an apartment complex type of or a multifamily type of structure, um, all in one building. And then we're also thinking that maybe there's an opportunity to do cottages surrounded surrounding a um, central facility. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice tonight. Um, there are, we're proposing these two uses in most of the zone districts, um, and I'll go through some of them in particular, but um, basically the age-restricted housing units would be allowed in places that there currently are allowed, multifamily, um, and the mixed-use zones. And then a conditional use permit in both the established neighborhood and the public zones, and I'll go into that a little bit in a little bit more detail later. Uh, senior congregate housing, the same zones, districts are allowed, uh, but we're going through a limited use permit with a little bit more of a review process. And then again, a conditional use in the EN and PB. Thank you. <clears throat> so for the special use permit, all, really all we're looking at is just making sure that they are for this age-restricted housing, because there's gonna be some bonuses or benefits later when I'll present. And then we also want the number of occupants determined when the process is, when the um, uh, use is approved. In the mixed use zones, so that would be the mixed use zone districts and, and the central business district, we want them to be allowed, but we want them to be in a mixed use building. So we want it to include non-residential and residential uses. We don't want the residential units on the first floor of the building. This is particularly important along our commercial corridors and in our downtown area, so that in our downtown. So that's what we're trying to do here. And then also age restriction housing, there is a clause in there about how they can be um, converted to full living units, going through a process and make, making sure you meet all the standards and pay the associated fees. In the EN and public zone, so that's the established neighborhoods in the public zone districts, we are proposing to allow these these, use, these uses, um, but they must be in an existing non-residential building or a legal non-conforming multifamily building. The idea is not to allow people to go in and tear down single family houses or things like that and build, build one of these units. It's more like how do we reuse an old school, an old church, um, an old, multi-family building that needs to be updated and converted to something else. So this is what, what we're looking for in these zone districts. The footprint can't be expanded. The height of the building can't be increased. We don't want any more additional impacts in the neighborhood. Most of these uh, buildings don't meet our standards anyway. They were built a long time ago, so we didn't want to do anything more to them. And we want the character of the building to be maintained, but we do. But it does allow changes to the building. You know, new windows, new doors, dormers to give better headroom, things along that line. Um, and then if the buildings are over 50 years old, we'd like to look at the historic guidelines just to look at the design elements and how to make the additions and modifications fit within the character of that zone. Um, we are proposing density adjustments. So age-restricted housing, we're going to consider instead of being one unit um, per every one of the units to be a full unit under our density, we're going to count it as a 0 0.75 dwelling unit. So, and then in the senior housing, kind of care, but we're proposing to count them as a half of a dwelling unit so that we can get more density in and we feel that the impacts of the units are so much less that the density bonuses make sense. Parking, um, these are, we're proposing right now one space per unit for the one bedrooms and the studios. This is, we already have this in our code, actually. It's, it's consistent with what we have for age-restricted age restricted units. Um, we're proposing 1.5 for two bedroom units. I think this is something that we will be watching to see um, just how much parking is really in these developments and maybe something that we can modify in the future, but this is what we're proposing right now. So that was the end of the housing. Do you, uh, when we could just go through them all, would you prefer? Okay, thanks. So the next thing we're doing is outdoor commercial recreation. This is actually a code section that um, we, we had in our old code, it was renamed to amusement parks, but what it really didn't do is address some of the low impact outdoor commercial uses, so that's what this is kind of coming back in and filling in. So this is the zip lines, the rock rope courses, rock climbing, frisbee golf, anything along that lines that doesn't have the motorized vehicles and the, the loud noises and all that associated things. This, that's what this use is for. Um, it's being proposed as a limited use in the zone districts listed on on here, but basically it's all of our commercial zones and our public zones, and our and then our um, residential or ag agriculture zone. 
setbacks are pretty standard for what you find along those corridors and those zonings. Lighting, we're not proposing any lighting in the residential agriculture zone, the RA zone, um, except for like parking lots or building lights, but not any of the um, activity being lit. Um, parking, we think a special study, these are also different, that special study should be required, and then the other standards are pretty general and normal. The next um, change is small cell telecommunication facilities. This is something that we've been asked to do. It's kind of the new thing that's coming for, from the wireless um, to provide the voice data uh, transmissions that we need. So we are trying to get ahead of the curve and create some standards. The, um, we're gonna use special use permits in all zone districts. They're allowed everywhere, but we wanted to have a way to review them. We want to match the structures and what they're mounted on and match existing infrastructure, so we're trying to uh, minimize the, the appearance. They can be, the height is actually the same as our antennas, which is 10 feet taller than the buildings or 10 feet over the maximum height in the zone district, whichever is less. This is the, if you read the staff report, this is the small amendment that we added from the Planning Commission. And then co-location is required, so. Uh, we really want to try not to have too many poles around town and try to have things located together. Um, just a kind of a picture to see what they look like. And then the idea is that you end up with these smaller units and then not the big structures. So another thing that we're adding into the um, code that just isn't there is wall plate offsets. So these are minimum wall plate offsets. So the, or plate, sorry, um, wall plate offsets. So what the code does is it has bulk standards that say you can have so much of a wall plane or so much of a height in wall plate, but then you have to break it to help break up the mass. The code has the wall plane standards, which is the horizontal, but they don't have wall plate height breaks. They don't tell you how far you have to offset that plate before you can continue going up with that plane. Uh, so we're putting them in the code and they range between four to six feet and two to four feet. So again, that's a plate height and then it steps back or forward and then it goes up again to break up the mass. Um, we're adding floor area ratio for duplexes in the mixed use neighborhood zone district. It, we see it as just a typo, it's just missing. It's, it's everywhere else. <coughs> minor, minor cleanup. Um, commercial vehicle storage, so this is what was proposed and then this has been modified based on the council um, study session that we had and I apologize, what was in your packet didn't have this corrected language in it, so uh, I've got an amendment to your motion. But this is what we're proposing right now. No commercial vehicles or vehicles exceeding two ton carrying capacity shall be parked on a parcel in a residential zone district nor in a parking space abutting such residential parcel except as needed on a temporary basis for delivery to or repair service of a residential use or the street improvements or utilities. And this language is really from our old code. It was never carried across and code enforcement asked us to put this back into the, the new code or newer code. Um, and then the other is no commercial vehicles or vehicles exceeding two ton car carrying capacity shall be parked overnight on any street. So both of these are, are cleanups, but the language in yellow is different from what you saw from study session. And hopefully this addresses the concerns that were raised. Um, next minor amendment is to the city engineer's responsibilities. Right now there's a <clears throat> list in the code of all the uh, administrator's responsibilities. And for the city engineer, one of them is curb cuts. Where they, where can they be? Where, how close to the corner? Where their spacing distances? We have, but didn't have width of the curb cuts and number. And so we wanted to give that authority to the city engineer, um, so that not everything has to go to a, a variance process. That he has some discretion in making these decisions. So that's what we're putting in, proposing for the city engineer. Um, we're cleaning up, we're adding some, I'm talking about campgrounds, um, we're adding some uh, definitions to our campground. This is the land use and development definition of campgrounds, and we're just adding what other vehicles that we're kind of missing before, recreation vehicles, converted buses, and buses. And the yeah, stuff in blue is what's new. And then another small definition change is in our group homes. We just wanted to make it consistent with what we're doing with the, our new sections, and so we have the group home at page 67. So that, and that's it for the proposed changes. Um, so the code does have criteria on what we need to do to amend itself. And um, it, it, we believe it does meet all the criteria. It is supported by the plans and policies 
of the comprehensive plan, and especially the housing plan for the housing elements. Um, we think it is consistent with everything else that it's adjacent to or with the articles it's being amended into. Uh, we do believe that it does meet all of the purposes that we need. So the Planning Commission heard this request on January 7th. They voted 4-0 to recommend approval of the proposed text amendment with the one minor clarification I pointed out. Um, attached to your, to your uh, agenda documentation is the code language and then also the Planning Commission minutes and staff report. There is no fiscal impact and we do believe that it does meet and comply with the comprehensive plan and the land use and development code. So our recommendation is, it is a recommendation that the, of the Planning Commission that the City Council by motion, and what I did in the motion is I added the yellow because that's what I proposed tonight, um, adopt the proposed land use and development code text amendment, including the amendment presented tonight, with the findings and conditions stated in the January 7th, 2019 Planning Commission staff report, and direct the City Attorney to prepare the enacting ordinance to adopt the amendments for first reading at a regularly scheduled Council meeting. Would you leave that up, please? Um, Ms. Flag, is there any, anyone for public testimony? <coughs> Don't think so. Then I'm going to open and close the public testimony. Any questions or comments from yeah. Council? Uh, I have a question for Ms. Vandegrift. Uh, this is something that just occurred to me as you were talking about the co-location. Uh, yeah, are there any issues with the capacity of the existing utility poles? Well, I don't have a clue. Um. <laughs> I, uh, let me uh, give you motivation for my question. Um, I've been wondering about the potential for rolling out fiber to the home in Durango. And in a conversation with the city manager some weeks ago, uh, he mentioned that the, uh, I believe, whoever owns the poles, I think it's La Plata Electric. Mm -hmm. um, had basically thrown an up, up to, uh, obstacle to hanging fiber uh, on the poles uh, with the, on, the, on the grounds that the poles lack capacity for so taking care of the additional uh, wires. And so that makes, you know, that then pops back into the issue of do, do the utility poles have the capacity for this small, small cell wireless equipment so i'm going to defer a part of that to to mark williams who's working with on the committee that's working on this um, but what i do know is they're really talking i think more like downtown on an existing street light or something along that line as opposed to the big utility poles because um, they they have a very short range and they need they need more of them and they need them kind of located to where the people are is my kind of understanding of it but i'm going to let mark answer it <laughs> Hello, Mark Williams, Community Development Department. So originally our understanding was there would be more small cell facilities downtown, and there still will be some, but there also will be on North Main, or the north part of Maine. Those poles are owned by LPEA on CDOT right of way. So we're going through a process to figure out exactly what rights we have to um, require, what it is we want to require. Really, the umbrella over all of this is that the Federal Communications Commission has really handcuffed local governments everywhere in the country as to what they can restrict and regulate on this. There's a lot of specific um, requirements in terms of the maximum that we can charge for a permit, how fast we have to issue permits, um, whether or not we can regulate based on perceived health and effects, which is we can't. Um, and, and a few other things. So what we're sort of left with is aesthetic regulations. We want to make sure that, <clears throat> like the picture that Vicki showed earlier, that when these small cells, and they're called small cells because they are relatively small, they're not anything like what you see on top of the West Building on 2nd Avenue. Um, but they look nice, you know, we don't want wires hanging all over the place. So um, if we can do that and then have the option to co-locate. That's really our main objective. And uh, when they're downtown, we'll have an extra layer of scrutiny if that's possible. We're still kind of working through this FCC guidance, with, which just got issued last month, I believe. 
and as Vicki referenced, there's an internal city team with myself, um, Julie Brown from finance, Eric Pearson from IT, Levi, city operations, um, to sort of figure out what we can and can't do. So it, does that mean that the co-location proposal isn't ready for prime time? Well, we have to have um, our ordinances adopted and in place before April. And that was another thing for this uh, January decree from the FCC. So when you factor in this first and second reading and the publication time and the waiting period, we had to get this ordinance through fairly quickly. And as far as we know, we can require co-location and that's what we want to do. I, my understanding is that they would still have to reach an agreement with the owner of the poles. Sure. So these regulations are essentially land use regulations on what the city wants to see. The underlying uh, agreements would have to be reached between those providers. Okay. So um, sadly, we are acting quickly and more, more likely than not. As this clarifies, we'll probably be back to make some changes yeah. to this. Well, I, I know there's also... Uh, the National League of Cities is trying to address this at the congressional level as well. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 thanks for explaining the timeline on this and also then the, the fact that we still have an agreement to reach. So the, so. Uh, it, in order to be able to implement that. Um, well, I was just which satisfies my our God. agreement, it would be that the small, the cell providers would still have to have an agreement with the owner of the polls to make the use of those polls. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's what okay. I'm saying. So anyway, um, that certainly satisfies <clears throat> the concern that just popped into my head. Well, with that, I, 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 I apologize as well because this didn't occur to me either during our study session. So, um, Ms. Vandergrip, I, with respect to the wall plate offset, mm -hmm. I'm really just trying to check myself and understand exactly what we're talking about. And maybe our architectural expert over here can tune in on this one. <laughs> Um, what you're saying is in terms of the, the actual massing on the building as it goes vertical, mm -hmm. between four and six feet, somewhere in there, depending on the square footage and, uh, well, the square footage of the lot area, it looks like, is where it changes. Mm -hmm. um, that's where they have to create a dimensional difference, either going... Mm, no. No, that's okay. Yeah. Tell me. No. So all of the zone districts have a maximum wall plate height. And it is, it's set in the, under the code. So in some of the residential zones, it may be 16 feet, it might be 22 feet. Commercial, it might be two stories, you know, so 20 foot, something like that. So those are all set in the code. Then if you wanted to go taller than that. All right, you, I got you. you set it, yeah. you set it in. Yeah, okay, cool. I just wanted to check. Any other questions? With that, I'll look for a, a decision by the council. I would move that we adopt the proposed land use and development code text amendments, including the amendment presented tonight, with the findings and conditions stated in the January 7th, 2019 Planning Commission staff report, and direct the city attorney to prepare the enacting ordinance to adopt the amendments for first reading at a regularly scheduled council meeting. I'll second that. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tim Music. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Brickey. Yes. Councilor Patin? Yes. Mayor Marvin? Yes. Uh, 8.2.1 is a public hearing to consider the ZIC addition annexation to 238 East Village Development Initial Zoning and Conceptual Plan Review. Mr. Williams? Okay. As you said, this is the ZIC annexation and initial zoning. It's also a part of a conceptual development plan. It's being developed as a Land development. So to give you some context, the property we're talking about is the white, actually my, my geometry vocabulary was better, trapezoid, rhomboid, I'm not sure. Anyway, this property is uh, what we're talking about. It's slightly over one acre, and the future land use is medium density residential. Right now, um, it's the home of two houses and Nate's saw sharpening business, which is going out of business. This is an aerial of the site. To the south is currently the home of what was gonna be the Durango Recovery Center. And to the north are some uh, Mercy housing uh, apartments. And these actually look a little bit
bit denser than they really are. This whole area, the future land use, like I said, is medium density, which allows up to 12 units an acre. This is 12 units an acre, and the proposal here would be 10 units an acre. So when we do an annexation, there are a lot of state statutes that any application has to comply with. These are all listed here. The application does comply. And as I said, um, P, it's going to be a PV at RN density. The planned development stage has three steps. We're in the first step right now. This is the, the stage where the broad uh, concept of the plan is either approved or not in terms of how much density can they have. Is the access going to work? Can utilities serve this project? If council approves it, then we would go back uh, to the preliminary stage in where the detailed engineering is done. Um, more details on a fair share program, for example, are done. Mr. Reynolds, the applicant, Tracy Reynolds, worked ahead a little bit, and so we actually have more design than we do for the houses at this stage, so that's fine. Uh, this is a site plan of the site. There are 10 <coughs> units. It will be done as detached townhouses, which we can do through the PD process. So each home will own, the owners will own the land underneath the unit, then the rest of the property will be um, in common ownership and managed through the HOA. There are five units here that have um, one car garages and five units here, which have two car garages. The houses are intended to range from 1,300 to 1,600 square feet and a mixture of two and three bedroom units. It's a concept of what it would look like. They're contemporary style architecture. Um, you've probably seen this style around Durango. One of the things I wanted to point out that we need to resolve at the preliminary plan stage is the uh, final design of the access drive. So the access drive come, comes in off Gigalink Gulch, uh, comes in like this. There's a hammerhead here for our service or emergency vehicles to turn around, which is becoming common. You might remember them from previous mm -hmm. infill development. We're doing a lot of infill projects right now because they're so constrained on site. This is a, a way to get uh, access into these sites um, without a cul-de-sac. And we're actually meeting internally to outline a new process so that we don't necessarily have to do a, a PD for infill developments to do that in the future. But at any rate, the one thing I wanted to point out was um, the original proposal was to have this, the driveway, the private drive here, and then a painted um, strip at the same grade as the pedestrian uh, walkway. And staff is not sure that it supports that, so we want to look at our different options. We prefer something that's a little bit more substantial, a concrete sidewalk. Now, whether that's separated by a full curb or there's a rollover curb, which you know, is a typical style maybe in the Riverview neighborhood, um, that's something we want to work through. There are a lot of there are advantages and disadvantages for each option. Um, you know, if you have a raised sidewalk, that's great. But then you've got a lot of tightly uh, uh, houses that are close to each other, so you could have a, some ADA issues because you would have so many curb cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and then whether or not we have uh, a tree lawn here, it's a pretty tight side, so that's something that we might have to. Um, relax our standards on and perhaps we have trees and tree grades or we have increased landscaping at the end. So that's something that will be determined at the next step. The color palette, the design and dimensions of the houses, um, these are things that we typically do, like I said, at the preliminary plan. Those will go in the annexation agreement. Not necessarily to say the houses have to look exactly like this and this house has to be red and gray, but just to have a color palette, you know, earth tones. Um, these colors and styles generally um, comply with the city's adopted design standards. We just want to look closely at, uh, at these houses at the next step to make sure that they meet our standards. And if they don't, um, is that OK? Because it is a PD.
some of the other things, maybe I should go back, talk about some more details before we get to the, the final part. Um, so parking is in garages. There are a few on street spaces. So there's a total of 25 parking spaces. Um, a little bit less than that is required by our code. We treat this as a multifamily development because all these houses are coming in at once through a townhouse arrangement. So it does meet our parking standards. Trash will be, right now it's proposed to be closer to the entrance of uh, the project. And the mailboxes will also be by the central trash receptacle. Uh, and then the detention will be in the southwest corner, which is over here. Because the site is over an acre, they'll have to treat their water before it's released, um, detained and treated. The fair share is interesting. Uh, typically for a project this size, the applicants tend to opt for the fee in lieu payment. But providing an affordable unit is not off the table, if my information is correct. And Mr. Reynolds will correct me if I'm wrong. But as far as I know, that's still something that will work out. And at the preliminary stage, we'll have a proposal so we'll either have a fair share a fee and lieu number, which um, if the predominant bedroom size for this is three bedroom, right now that would be about $89,000. Or we'll have uh, an actual affordable housing unit, which would be restricted and made available to someone who was income qualified to purchase that. We'll also have uh, an amenities area that will need to be identified in more detail in the preliminary stage, just a small area with a picnic table or a swing and slide for children who live in the development. And this is a Cedar Ridge, which is just up the street up Gigaline Gulch Road from this project site. So they did do a sidewalk with a detached, uh, they did a detached sidewalk with a tree lawn. This is a much bigger site though. It's more than three acres, I believe, which so it's more than three times the size of this. Um, but I thought it was interesting to see um, what has happened in the immediate vicinity. These are select conditions of approval. I don't necessarily want to read all of these. I can go into more detail uh, into any of these. But I think the big ones are that it meets the annexation and city conceptual plan criteria. The density seems to work. It can be parked. Looks like we can do an access, a walkway up there. We still have detention on site, trash pickup, and a place for our trucks and vehicles to turn around. All plans. After this, we'll have to meet city standards. Um, and we're going to negotiate the fair share in more detail in the next stage. So the recommendation of the Planning Commission to the City Council approve the annexation initial zoning and conceptual plan and ask the applicant to create the preliminary plan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Williams. I'm going to open this up to a public hearing. Was there anyone? No? Nope. All right, so open. The public hearing is open and closed. And would the applicant like to say anything? Nope. Okay. Uh, questions from Council? It's, uh, I support, uh, let's support the annexation and initial zoning. Uh, that's what this stage is for. Mm -hmm. I think uh, staff is challenged with uh, evaluating grades. I'm not, we're all familiar with these properties up at Line Gulch and uh, you know the successful projects and the ones that aren't so successful. And and uh, you know I think the issues that have been pointed out in terms of the detached walkway uh, and um, you know that'll come out in the in the detailed grading drainage plans on how to yeah. how that really works and strict compliance with our grades uh, our grade requirements getting up into there and now having worked on a number of those sites that's usually the challenge and usually the limitation of these properties um, i'd like to get as many units up there i particularly like the, the notion of as, as much as i like the homes fund and the, the and the people that run it i like the the idea of actually provision of a uh, affordable unit, designated affordable unit to satisfy that requirement. Uh, I think we need to do more of that. And if the applicant is uh, able to do that, that I would uh, support that heartily. Um, 
And uh, with that, uh, I think it's a, it's a good addition to Giggling Gold's Road. Uh, any other comments? I would uh, just uh, reiterate uh, Councilor Brookie's remark about preferring to have an affordable unit if we can manage it. Um, the other question I had was procedural, whether we need to make, whether the motion would need to specifically include the conditions um, as approved at the, as recommended at the Planning Commission. Does the documentation say? Uh, it, uh, the, doc the, the recommendation in the staff Doesn't report indicate. does not uh, include that. But, mm. uh, you can always add that. I think that's well, it is there. Should be, should be oh, am I the wrong one? Yeah, it's a question, is that, is that implicit or should we be specific about it? Or are there other conditions we'd like to impose at this time? Right. Mm. I think the motion should include those particular. Then that's what you need to orchestrate in the, okay. in the motion. With that, I'll look for a motion. Any other comments? Mm. No. Well, I would move that we approve the ZIC addition uh, 238 East Village Annexation Initial Zoning and Conceptual Plan uh, with the conditions um, forwarded from the Planning Commission and direct the applicant to submit the preliminary plan for review. Second. I'll say. Roll call, please. Councillor Bettine. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Brookie. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf. Yes. Mayor Marbury. Yes. Thank you. Moving into 8.2.2, which is a public hearing to consider a major amendment to the Hawks Nest Plan Development. And uh, the staff will be presenting. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Honorable member, Members of the Council. My name is Dan Montano uh, with Community Development. This is a request for an amendment to the Hawks Nest PD. Um, the applicant, Jacob Nestor, is planning to open his business, the Underground Range, at 780, uh, sorry, yeah, 789 Tech Center Drive. Um, and the Hawks Nest plan development and indoor shooting range is not currently listed as an allowed use, so uh, hence the need for this amendment. Um, and approve the language shown on the slide and be added to the list of the allowed uses for lots three through six. Um, and it's important to note that um, the language does include that the use is developed in accordance with state and federal regulations. Here's an aerial of the location. The parcel's outlined in blue. And uh, you can see Tech Center Drive right up the middle of the photo. And the uh, parcels to the left of Tech Center Drive are Cox Nest Plan Development. And here's an aerial view of the building and property from the south. Uh, the proposed gun range would be located in the western portion of the building, entirely below grade. Uh, you can kind of see the um, ramp going down to the below grade portion of the building. That would be the entrance to the range. Um, LEDC requirements for PD amendments uh, in order to add an allowed use to a plan development um, that would be considered a major amendment. Um, and section 63710 states that in order to approve a major amendment, the applicant must first receive uh, written approval from two thirds of the property owners within the PD. And the applicant has received uh, approvals from seven of the nine property owners. The city of Durango is one of the property owners in the PD. We abstained from voting. Um, and let this process determine our approval. Um, so there was really only one property owner who did not approve of the amendment. As far as compatibility with the comp plan, uh, the entire Hawks Nest uh, plan development is designated as mixed commercial light industrial. Uh, the LEDC doesn't have standards for indoor shooting ranges. Um, we do have standards for outdoor shooting ranges and they're allowed in two of our commercial zones, commercial general and commercial regional. Uh, staff finds that these zones are similar enough to this future land use designation, uh, such as the, so that this um, designation does not conflict with uh, this use. Uh, for review comments, we did have an opportunity to sit down with Interim Chief Brammer uh, and discuss 
the proposal. Uh, he was able to review the operations procedures uh, and the location and did not have any concerns. Um, we discussed uh, the cleanup procedures that the range will use with the utilities division. Um, initially, the applicant proposed using a high phosphate detergent to um, kind of clean up the lead residue, and that was going to be disposed of into the municipal sewer. Um, utilities had some concern with that based on the fact that phosphates are a uh, considerable pollutant in natural waterways. Um, since the planning commission meeting, the applicant has determined that there is a non-phosphate detergent that can be used. Um, utilities had a chance to look at that uh, detergent and had a lot fewer concerns, um, and they don't expect to need to sample the discharge before um, it goes into the municipal sewer at this point. Um, as for public comment, we did not receive uh, any comments uh, before the Planning Commission meeting. I did have an opportunity after that meeting to chat with the one property owner who did not approve of the uh, possible amendment. His biggest concern was hearing gunshots. He owns a property to the north. Um, I talked to him about the applicant's uh, requirements in order to do uh, to use soundproofing, and um, I think that assuaged some of his concerns. I also offered him the opportunity to submit written um, comments and he declined to do so. Um, so we had an opportunity to really determine whether or not this use was appropriate in this uh, plan development. The PD agreement, first of all, states that land uses in the development shall be primarily commercial and industrial uh, based on uh, the city standards for outdoor gun ranges and those uh, being allowed with the CUP in commercial zones. Uh, we felt that it would be appropriate in this PD. Um, the, uh, the outdoor shooting range standards, uh, they basically revolve around um, isolating the neighboring properties from uh, possible <laughs> bullet fragments or uh, sound proofing, it's just stuff like that. Um, since this range would be entirely enclosed indoors, most of those standards don't really apply. Um, however, design standards are important to, to consider. Um, going back to the requirement that, that the range comply with all federal and state guidelines, there is a document promulgated by the Department of Energy called the Range Design Criteria, uh, which really lays out the standards, <coughs> excuse me, for um, how, how a range must be built. Um, so I think that if this range complies with those, those standards, then um, it would meet the intent of the LUTC. Uh, further criteria for a PD amendment, um, these are basically just if, the, uh, if there's a, a new use, um, there must be changes in area or market conditions, changes in adopted plans, <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> or if there were conditions that weren't foreseen at the time of the uh, at the time that the plan was approved, and we find that generally uh, these these are all met in this case. Uh, so for our staff recommendations, uh, we find that the proposal meets the LEDC requirements for PD amendment. Um, it's compatible in this location, and the design of the range uh, should meet. The intent of the LUDC provided it meets those ranges up design criteria, and we recommend approval of the amendment. And on January 7th, the Planning Commission did vote 4 to 0 to recommend a conditional approval, uh, approval of the amendment. Um, this was based on the previous discussion about the discharge uh, with the uh, phosphate, uh, the phosphate detergent. Um, with the change to a non-phosphate detergent uh, and the, uh, the reduced concerns of the utilities department, um, this condition may or may not be necessary moving forward. And that's it. Thank you. Were there, uh, <clears throat> anyone want to speak? Okay, I'll open the public meeting and close the public meeting and have questions for the council to the uh, staff or the applicant. 
I'd just like to say uh, congrats, uh, thanks for uh, staff for the m significant amount of due diligence for this unique uh, use, it's certainly an education for us, and uh, and I think uh, certainly answered my questions, especially reaching out to the, the one uh, property owner that was concerned. Uh, I, I was going to ask about what, you know what his issues were uh, and if they could be mitigated in any way. So it sounds like that is uh, at least under control and uh, the environmental concerns that you've raised and have answered. So uh, I, th I think at that point, although I'm a, not a gun range user, I think it's a significant uh, need in our community and uh, probably a perfect location for it. Uh, any questions, Councilor Light? Councilor Bettine? Uh, just one quick one. Uh, relative to that one concern, you mentioned uh, the soundproofing in your research. Is it how soundproof are these facilities? Um, I'll probably let the applicant speak to that. Okay. I think uh, he, he laid out a pretty good explanation of that. I'm not sure the exact decibel levels that um, are required in that document that was referenced, but um, it's significantly reduced and to virtually uh, no sound. But uh, again, I'll call it the applicant. I'd like to add one question to that time of operations. Is this uh, from seven o'clock in the morning till midnight, or you know it, that might have something to do with? I know there are residential units in close proximity up there. I don't believe there are no, residential units. No, there's not. But the recycling center's up there. Mm, right uh, above Trotner Engineering. Yeah. In the back there. Yeah. yeah. No, there are there are dwelling units up there. It's big. Uh, yeah, I'm not aware of residential units up there. Um, again, I think I can look the app and speak to the hours of operation. Um, but uh, staff didn't have concerns um, to that point. So. I think Mayor Pro Tem has a question. Sure. I do too, as well. Um, I, uh, you answered some of my questions regarding noise and uh, safety, but I would love to hear, if possible, from Officer Bramer about um, you know what. You, just given the safety issues, I would just love to hear what he said. I'm very glad that you um, spoke to him through this process and that he was able to review it. And I, I just would love, as we approve this, to hear from him too, if possible. I also had a question about the uh, disposal of the lead bullets. How, how, what's the dis how do you do that? Um, yeah, there's a pretty detailed process for that. Again, I'm not an expert. In okay, I'll ask the applicant. Yeah, so, one of my concerns. Um, Why don't we hear from the applicant? I bet he's got all the answers. Jacob Nestor, 228 Jenkins Ranch Road. Mm -hmm. I'd love to answer any questions you have. Great. Could well, you speak I, up, please? We'll, Certainly. We'll start with uh, Councilor Brook. He had a question about what was the hours? Yeah, yeah, hours of operation this, that might. Uh, lend itself to noise Certainly. issues. We're very fortunate in that we are underground. Uh, so submerged concrete walls. We have an eight inch concrete ceiling. So we're pretty close to meeting the 60 decibels already required by the industrial, light industrial uh, region. Uh, in addition to that, um, we're adding another wall within that the soundproof barrier. Even the paint and the coating that goes over has a thin sheet of metal uh, in addition to that. On the ceiling, between the eight inches of concrete and the beams, we're adding more soundproofing, and they are uh, self-healing mats, so a bullet does entrapment in there. It uh, is embedded and covered and protected from the next one and not a ricochet. Um, so the hours of operation will really depend on what the police department needs, what the SO needs. Um, we could have middle of the night shooting. Um, we're very fortunate to not have any residents up there, and it will be sound mitigated to the point of even standing in the parking lot you may not even be able to hear it 60 decibels is pretty minor in my opinion oh, absolutely. Uh, i mean that's that's down to a tolerable yeah. level and we hope to do even more but that's what we have to do by city standard uh, my question concerned the how do you what are you doing with the the bullets once they're we're very lucky that we recycle and resell them so we are contracting now post this meeting Mm -hmm. uh, we've already made contact with a few companies and they travel around. Uh, we have a really cool system, unique system, um, a closed catch entrapment okay. uh, that catches the lead bullets within the back 
and we have a drawer and a set height. We roll drums over and feed the drums with that, and then they carry them up back. And so do you anticipate this for uh, private use, uh, police officers, the sheriff department? Do you anticipate uh, machine guns? Is this handguns? I'm curious. All handguns, and public and private. So we'll definitely be meeting at all the needs of the local Law enforcement. Law enforcement, absolutely. Uh, but it will be also a public range. So just to clarify, I heard all handguns. Uh, correct. So that means no? No automatic weapons, no rifles, no shotguns, all pistols. Interesting. Now we do have, I mean, be clear though, there is potential for expansion for rifles in the future, mm -hmm. uh, but it would be no automatic weapons. No automatics. And you had a question, Mayor? I was going to get just here from our... All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Since you were there firsthand, and, or, you know, since you've investigated it, I'd love to hear. Yes. Um, so I looked at the, the design schemes of it and everything, and everything looks fine. I mean, I've gone to some range developmental classes myself in my younger years as a police officer, uh, being a range officer. So these things are legit. They're on the up and up. Uh, the systems, the capture systems are really interesting. The, the, centrifugal so they slow down the bullet velocity and they stop them and essentially a lot of these systems will actually cap them, capture them in like a five gallon Home Depot bucket mm -hmm. at the end of the travel. Uh, the noises, you're probably not even going to be able to hear it. It'll be my guess outside, and especially being a below grade uh, facility. So we don't have any concern from the police department standpoint. What about the numbers of people at one time shooting? Um, I, would you have 15 lanes? Yeah. And that's the key component to what his facility is going to be, too, is they're going to have somebody on staff who's trained um, up to a certain level of those NRA certifications, correct? Correct. Yeah, and they're going to be on site at any given time, so they're going to be overseeing. So it's not just going to be you can just show up, you check your lane out, you go in there and you shoot all by yourself. Um, it's going to be completely monitored. They're going to have staff on site at all times. Well, thank you very much thank for you the very much. Absolutely. Uh, since the public hearing is closed and there's no more questions, I'll look for them. I've got one question. What, what was the previous use of this uh, space? Yes, uh, uh, the previous use was a marijuana grow facility that has since been done. Right. Yep. So. And just another point of clarification while I'm up here, I did check in the PD agreement. Uh, the only residential use that's allowed in the PD is a custodial residential use. Right, right. Yeah, it, and when I mentioned that, I didn't think it was in Hawks Nest particularly, but there, okay, it, gotcha. in in the trip in the tech center, there are residences, but that might be affected. But I don't. At six decibels, I think it's tolerable. Okay, I'll look for a motion from the council. I'll make a motion to approve the Hawks Nest Major PD amendment with findings and conditions as reflected in the Planning Commission minutes of January seventh, two thousand nineteen. I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor White? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Brickey? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving into 8.2.3 of public hearing to consider the Mercury Village Plan Development Major Amendment and Mercury Village Lot 4 Minor Subdivision. Staff up report, please. Savannah Davis Community Development. This is for the major amendment to Mercury Village Lot 4 and the minor subdivision. These are two separate items and they will require two separate motions, but they're going to be reviewed together as they're connected together. Um, last February, this was brought before you uh, as Tap River Food Hall at Mercury Village Lot 4. Mercury Village is a PD that was approved in 2012. Um, and City Council approved Tap River uh, Food Hall. Since then, the owner, since this is a large lot, um, proposed to go ahead and subdivide it. It is the subdivision that is requiring the major PD amendment. They are also um, applying for residential use of this um, new lot that will be subdivided out. That also requires this major uh, PD amendment. So here's the context, as you know, it's um, by the river, its zoning is the PD zone, and it's in the river corridor overlay, so it's just south of the Durango Mall, just south of um, Mercury. 
So the process is that Mercury <clears throat> Village was reviewed um, by Planning Commission on January 7th. Uh, they reviewed it and approved it with the conditions in the staff report. Uh, then you will review it, and if it is approved, then it will go to a finer, final minor subdivision plan review that is administrative. <clears throat> For the major PD amendment, as you saw with Hawk's Nest, um, this requires approval of two-thirds of the property owners. Um, Mercury Village is four lots with open space. Of the four lots, three of those owners signed agreement um, for um, support, and so it met those requirements of two-thirds. Uh, Excuse again, me, um, three out of five is not two-thirds. Three to four. It's three out of four, so oh. the um, open space is dedicated to the city okay. of Durango, and it is it does not have street frontage, so it's not a developable lot. So of the four that are developable okay. lots, it did meet that requirement. All right, thank, thank you. for the correction. <clears throat> Um, so as I mentioned, the major PD amendment is to allow minor subdivision of lot four. So this would be now lot four RA and lot four RB. Lot four RB will be the Tap River that was approved last year. And then um, they, staff is recommending that mixed use be allowed on lot four RA. And the reason for this is that it is completely surrounded by mixed use. There is not a sole lot that is just residential until you get further south all the way down by Escalante Drive. So to fit in with the area and the PD that is um, business and retail, staff is recommending that for this lot that it be allowed mixed use. This is the future land use map, and as you can see, the future land use map has this designated as a mixed use um, lot. For the minor subdivision, this would divide the lot um, into the two parcels, as mentioned, um, one being mixed use and one being the restaurant use. For the major PD amendment, staff is recommending approval with the condition that it be mixed use so that it is in compliance with the future land use map um, and that vacation rentals not be allowed in the Mercury Village plan development. Uh, this is because we do have a housing shortage and we want to encourage that long-term housing <coughs> in this PD um, and that all written, verbal, and graphic representation by the applicants or the representatives shall be deemed conditions of approval. And then the second one is the preliminary minor subdivision plan. And again, um, Planning Commission reviewed this and had the recommendation to City Council to include all plat language, plat notes, and easement dedications determined appropriate by city staff on the final plat. All future development beyond the proposed subdivision will be subject to future reviews and approvals in accordance with the requirements of the LUDC. So this, any future development would be a site plan review by staff. All written, verbal, and graphic representations of the applicant shall be deemed conditions of approval. And all comments provided by city staff shall be addressed prior to the recordation of the subdivision plan. So I'll go back to the major PD amendment as the first motion. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's like with no one. I'll open the, the uh, public hearing and close the public hearing, and I will look for questions from the council. I have one question, which is uh, given we, there's no representation of uh, exactly where that property line is drawn uh, at this point. We know it's going to be separated, and uh, but well, they're, they're right there. So is there any elements of the uh, previously approved restaurant that would, would have bled over into that other property or is it clearly a standalone parcel that was not any, that didn't have any useful function in the previously approved plan? It did not have any function. So right here would be the parking lot. So they will share an entrance with the parking lot and they'll have an access easement that will cross across the parking lot and go into there. But other than that, this was all going to be vacant mm -hmm. space. And there's no, the, the elements such as perhaps common drainage detention and those kinds of things. I mean, you just mentioned parking, but I'm trying to think of any other issues that might have been um, 
that might be? All of those would be reviewed in the site plan review. So okay. once we actually know what type of building we're getting, how much square footage it's going to cover, lot coverage, we'd review drainage, detention, parking requirements. Mm -hmm. But I just, I'm trying to think of, you know, if the folks that already have, are pre-approved on that other project, you know, find out that they lost something no, as a result of this action. <clears throat> no, everything will stay the same for them, so this won't deter from them. Okay. Is the applicant here tonight? Yes. Okay. I would, I have, my only question is just if they're okay with the mixed use designation, obviously it's zoned that way, but I was just curious how that went down in the conversations with staff. Tracy Bell on the slope of 40 Main Avenue. Um, Ed's traveling today, he couldn't be here, so I'll, I'll speak for him. He would have preferred to have strictly residential, but he will accept the, the mixed use okay. designation. Thanks, Tracy. Any other comments? Well, it occurs to me that, you know, in aggregate, but for subdividing for financial, for lending purposes, I guess, and ownership purposes, you know, the, the aggregate parcel is mixed use. I mean, but you've got housing on one thing, and so. Yeah, I guess that's, you know, that's where I'm kind of coming from is like the, you know, it's a mixed use area, no matter how you shake this out and to, put that provision in this approval requires the developer then to build something associated with that. And I was trying to envision it in my head. I know it could be a office space upstairs or whatever, but I, that seems restrictive to me in this particular application, this particular site, given that I, I know that the concern, at least from my understanding, was that um, they don't want homeowners coming in potentially and being essentially surrounded by what is mixed use. But to me, this is extremely obvious what you're buying into. You literally turn into a highly commercialized development to get to your home. And I, I just think, um, you know, this council in particular has had uh, a desire to increase more housing opportunity as one of its major goals. And um, to sort of arbitrarily say you have to have an office space in this spot, we're not lacking in office spaces, and I know it's not arbitrary. I know it. I know it's part of the zoning, but um, it's, the actually, it's actually part of the future land use map, so we would require an amendment to the comprehensive plan land use map to make it residential. So I just wanted to add that note. So, so you're considering each parcel, yeah, and, right? Yeah, and that is the rule. Um, it, so, but if it, but for the subdivision, yeah, you know, so, I mean, that, I guess that's the, the, the crux. If the, if the owner were to develop both properties, he could build all residences on the other end of the property, but for the financial mechanisms required for lending, right? Different ownerships and that kind of thing. So a single developer could do a bunch of houses at one end and the restaurant bar the other yeah the this other. had come to us as one pr product when we approved it the first time right it would have met the zoning requirement on a single site and but for having to subdivide we're sort of putting the criteria on based on the zoning and everything else which which is the rules and yeah. that's what we've established and staff has accurately interpreted that i believe it sounds like there's a lot of opportunity though I mean, I can think of years ago when we were talking about Ewing Mesa, and that's got to be 15 more years. <clears throat> we talked about um, mixed use, residential on top, and um, a cleaners on below, let's say. So I can see a lot of opportunity for this, and especially since it's a large commercial area, next to a large commercial area, you know that if you're buying there, it's probably going to be a home that you're going to turn the key and walk away. You know, I, I can see it as snowbirds almost uh, because, and then again, you have the restaurants, you have the theater, you have the shopping mall. It looks to me like there's going to be some opportunity out there. Yeah, I just, it's, an, it's a restriction I'm not super comfortable with. Um, so let me understand, there's no pathway toward us approving this uh, without the requirement that it's multi-use? It would have to go through the 
comprehensive plan future land use map amendment. So the applicant would have to initiate yes. that process. They right. chose not to do that, or they could come back and do that. Yeah. They could come back to do that, but at this point, they really want to get this done. Okay. Go. If, if they hadn't subdivided it, would they be in the same predicament? No, if they had not subdivided, um, then they could have done just the residential, and then they would have had the. They could have done the residential if they hadn't subdivided it. And I'm, the, I'm comfortable with the, the the developers evaluated their options and made this determination and request of us. So. Yeah, I, I don't see us second guessing the applicant. Correct. This is how they came in. So this is what we're what we're evaluating. Comments? Yeah, I had one <clears throat> one other question. Um, how does uh, what is who are the other owners and does this Im does this uh, change in the PD impact the potential use of other other undeveloped parcels on that in the development? So at this point, this is the last one that can be developed. So okay, it is. The hotels have been built on the other one. Mercury was the first one. And then this is the last vacant parcel. And, uh, so it shouldn't have a significant impact. And who is who is the uh, who is who is the uh, may I ask who <coughs> was the owner who did not um, contribute a letter of support? I believe it's Spring Hill Suites. Is that okay? So it's one of the hotels. There? And they didn't oppose, but they didn't support either. So kind of okay. Middle ground. I'd just like to reiterate, or not reiterate, state that this is one of the most critical parcels of land as a gateway into our community. And uh, I encourage them to, the staff to uh, use everything they can to make sure, assure that this is a quality project and aesthetically pleasing and, and a truly a gateway project. With that, I'm going to ask for a recommendation from the city council. Need a motion. Do we need two motions? Yes, we need two. Oh, I think do we only have to combine one. We combined it on the, the but I think we need two motions. But we have to yes, two. two separate motions. So the first will be major. Oh I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then I will move that we approve the Mercury Mercury Village major P D amendment with findings <coughs> and conditions as reflected in the planning commission minutes of January seventh, twenty nineteen. Second. Roll call, please. Councillor Patin? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. I need another motion. I'll follow through and say we I move that the we approve the Mercury Village lot for minor subdivision with findings and conditions as reflected in the Planning Commission minutes of January seventh, twenty nineteen. Second. Roll call, please. Councillor Patin? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Young? Yes. Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving into an ordinance 10.1, an ordinance amending chapter 27 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango Land Use and Development Code by the amendment and addition of portions of tables and sections <coughs> of 2 3 2 3 dash three dash one dash two dash three and three dash one dash two dash four and three dash one dash five dash one to allow for accessory dwelling units i'll look to the ordinance sir this is ordinance uh 2019-6 i won't reread it uh, Thank you. for obvious reasons <laughs> This is intended to allow ADUs in the EN4, EN5, and EN6 zones uh, per the vote of the council at the last uh, regular meeting. So we worked extensively with the uh, planning department on getting these changes uh, adopted. So I think it's ready for adoption by council. All right, I'll look for a motion from council. And what was the number? Six. 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 I'll move that we approve ordinance 2019-6. I'll second. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Brookie? Yes. Councilor Patin? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. 
And moving into item 11.11 .11 is a discussion and possible action concerning approval of a purchase agreement between the City of Durango, La Plata County, and Somebody Properties, LLC, for a 12.523 acre parcel and incorporated improvements adjacent to the existing airport terminal to be used for terminal infrastructure development and directing the city manager to execute a contract and close on the acquisition. Let's go, Tony. All right. Good evening, City Council. Tony McCary, Director of Aviation at the Durango La Plata County Airport. Here to talk to you today about a potential airport land acquisition. Uh, first, I want to outline the property that we are looking at for acquisition. It is 820 Airport Road in Durango. Uh, the, Onya, uh, the owner is Quinonia Properties, Thank LLC. You. Uh, it's 12 point, <laughs> just over 12.5 total acres. About six of those acres are currently occupied by building and uh, existing development. The other six and a half acres are fenced outside storage and staging area. Um, the parcel does contain two separate buildings uh, comprising about 240,000 square feet of office and warehouse space, as well as septic, high-speed fiber, and primary and secondary electrical lines to the property. Uh, the map you can see here outlines the property. Uh, the, the area outlined in red is the existing overall terminal area um, that exists today. The area outlined in yellow is the acquisition site. You can see this lies roughly north-northeast of the current terminal um, and is an adjacent to it that is bisected by the existing County Road 309A. Uh, short background on why we are looking at this acquisition. Um, as the council is familiar, the airport did conduct a, an airport master plan study that was completed in 2016. Um, as a result of that study, a preferred alternative was identified, which uh, proposed the development of the east side of the existing airport uh, for the ultimate expansion of terminal facilities. Uh, a ballot issue was put um, on, in front of the Plata County voters in the November of 2016, uh, proposing a property tax initiative to fund uh, part of those improvements. Uh, that ballot initiative was not successful. Uh, what we found ourselves today is that our preferred alternative for long-term development at the terminal is currently not fundable. Uh, we have a minimum $45 million investment that needs to be procured locally, and we don't have a viable funding mechanism to obtain that level of, of funding in the current fiscal environment. Uh, meanwhile, we're continuing to see pressure on our existing facilities uh, with continued growth uh, throughout the air service market in southwest Colorado and finding ourselves looking for development opportunities that can continue to match that growth as well as just the existing demand for today. So this acquisition parcel came on the market in very late 2017. Um, and frankly, the, the voluntary acquisition of land adjacent to a commercial service airport is an extremely rare opportunity. Uh, this type of opportunity does not come very often. It was not foreseen throughout any previous planning opportunities. Uh, if we are to acquire this land, it allows for us to look at more unconstrained growth alternatives to be considered um, as we look to meet our growing demand. So if you think back to the airport master plan, for those that were involved in that process, one of the big underlying factors about why the ultimate east side development was selected as the preferred alternative was the fact that the existing terminal facilities are uh, by and large landlocked. Uh, to our west is a major topographical drop off into the Florida River Valley. To our east is airfield infrastructure, which is immovable. And north and south of us was existing commercial development. Uh, north ex uh, essentially being this property. So that was one of the, the major underlying factors that pushed us to look at the east side of development, saying if we're looking at long-term, 30-plus year development of the terminal, are we going to run out of space, quite frankly? And that was a consideration that had to be looked at severely and why we ended up looking the way we did. Uh, this pr opportunity presents us an opportunity to look back at that and reconsider with that acquisition. Uh, and then lastly, land acquisition of this nature is eligible for FAA grant reimbursement through their airport uh, improvement program. So what would we do with the parcel? Um, in the short term, the existing buildings would be leased back to Quinonia Properties, uh, LLC, uh, the existing operator, for a minimum of two years while we conduct our own internal planning efforts uh, to figure out funding sources and future development needs for that parcel. That also represents cash flow for the airport in the short term. Long term, uh, we're likely to use that land uh, for a variety of potential things, one being additional passenger vehicle parking, which is uh, the biggest overall space utilization at any airport is surface parking for vehicles. Uh, rental car facilities, circulation road, and or airport entrance road realignment, all of which would free up land around the existing terminal site for us to be able to expand in a potentially phased and incremental manner as uh, need dictates into the future. 
Um, and by doing so, we leverage our existing utility infrastructure and our existing airfield infrastructure, which were major, major impediments about why we were looking at a, an $85 million investment to, to move uh, facilities to the east side of the runways. It is a greenfield site. We don't have utility infrastructure. We don't have taxiways, aprons, roadways, all of that, all of which does exist on the west side where we're looking. Um, just uh, take these with a grain of salt. These are conceptual alternatives. These have not been highly vetted, but they do provide uh, the council with a, a pictorial evidence of uh, how we might envision this parcel being used. So you can see the, the, the parcel is sort of on the right side of your screen here um, that is being considered for acquisition. These are just three scenarios that show how the potential facilities could grow over time, mainly used as showing that parcel is long-term parking, but also considering the potential for uh, rental car facilities to be relocated to the area as well as entrance road and circulation. Um, these are all just different scenarios that would allow for a totally different range of things to be studied. <clears throat> each of which meet the, the needs of the airport master plan. So our master planning efforts um, are not in vain. The, the, the meat and potatoes of that exercise remain in place. Our needs, our long-term forecasts remain in place. And what we've, we've essentially vetted through this acquisition is by acquiring those 12 and a half acres of land, we can meet the long-term projections, forecasted projections of growth at the durango Lapata County Airport with this acquisition and not have to worry about the landlock status of the airport hampering long-term growth at our airport facility. So acquisition details, the appraised value was $3.9 million. That was completed and finalized in November of 2018. Uh, that offer of just compensation was made to the, the current owner um, at $3.9 million in early December. Uh, it was um, accepted by the owner uh, two days later on the 6th of December. Uh, as we stated earlier, the current owner does desire to lease back the buildings and parking lots for a minimum of two years. Uh, lease revenue would total $12,500 per month uh, through December of 2019, and then thereafter that rate would be increased to $16,250 per month for the remaining term of the lease, all representing ca positive cash flow for the airport. Um, and we are projecting a current closing date of June 17. Uh, offer contingencies, uh, just breeze through these real quick. First off is approval of the real estate purchase contract uh, by this body as well as the Lapata County Board of Commissioners who are scheduled to, to take a look at this uh, one week from today. Uh, we also have to appropriate the additional funds. Uh, we'll talk shortly about what the funding mechanism is. Uh, we need to um, satisfactory uh, negotiate an IGA between the city and county. Uh, regarding the acquisition of this parcel specific to the financing details, which we'll also touch on shortly, um, assess any uh, environmental findings, and also make sure we get a fair market value lease in place. So all of these uh, contingencies are currently in progress between the airport and the seller, um, and we uh, feel confident about the ability to check each of these boxes. Uh, financial impact, as I mentioned, the negotiated purchase price is $3.9 million. Um, it also mentioned it is eligible for FAA grant reimbursement um, at a rate of 91.88%, our current FAA grant match uh, with a CDOT overmatch of 4.06, uh, leaving the 4.06 as the local investment. Uh, if you do the math on that, it's just shy of about $160,000 post reimbursement. Um, that grant timing has been programmed in our uh, federal fiscal year 2021. Um, so we work a CIP, a capital improvement plan, with the FAA on a yearly basis, programming all of our potential capital needs at the airport. Um, after this acquisition has come to light, we've worked with the FAA to get this programmed in, and it's currently in our accepted CIP for 2021. Um, so what that means is we have to carry an acquisition expense until that reimbursement can come into place um, approximately two years from today. So what we're doing is pursuing lease purchase financing um, to, in order to maintain a strong airport cash position. So the airport has done a great job of, of bolstering its reserves over the last handful of years, and we're starting to get into a, an even stronger fiscal position, feeling strong about where we're at, but we're not quite in the point where we can uh, lay out $3.9 million over a two-year term without um, extending ourselves very uh, thin. So we are looking at financing costs for this acquisition. Uh, details of that, uh, we're looking, as I mentioned, lease purchase uh, financing uh, with the acquisition property itself pledged as the asset. Um, so issuance fees for this will total approximately $75,000. That's an estimate at this point, but a fairly uh, good one. That will be a, a local expense. It's not eligible for reimbursement, so we will bear that locally. And then our annual lease purchase expense uh, will be just shy of uh, about a half a million dollars, dependent on some final interest rate um, calculations that would come about. 
overall. Um, what we're looking for in terms of a funding mechanism on this are passenger facility charges. So PFCs, uh, as, as we've discussed with the council in the past, are user fees assessed at the airport. Uh, these are not tax related in any way. Um, it is a $4.50 surcharge that is assessed to every outbound ticket uh, for every passenger leaving from DRO to any destination. Uh, those fees are collected by the airlines when you purchase your ticket, ultimately remitted back to the airport for eligible airport infrastructure projects. These projects are funded and vetted by the FAA and ultimately our, our funds are approved for those uses. Um, so we would be using strictly airport user fees to pay for this acquisition. Um, by using PFCs, our, our balance is currently strong. We have a balance of about $3.6 million today on the PFC fund side. Um, with this acquisition, as well as the other planned capital projects in place at the airport, um, over the next 10 years, our PFC balance remains greater than a million dollars throughout the entirety um, of that entire um, period of time. So we feel strongly about our ability to fit in this acquisition into our long-term capital plans without uh, putting the airport into a, a disadvantaged position relative to either this project or other ones we have on the books today. Um, and lastly, acquisition rewards, just to kind of sum it up, uh, what this does, as I mentioned, is allows us to study new alternatives for terminal area development. We have additional acreage and additional access opportunities, and it opens up a whole barrel of opportunities for us to study. Um, it also allows us to look at an incremental development strategy using air, uh, airport revenues to fund development over time. The big challenge of the east side is that it's a greenfield site. The minimum investment was so high that it, there was no viable funding mechanism to uh, initiate development other than looking for a taxpayer infusion. Um, with this opportunity now presenting itself, we can bet out and look at realistic incremental funding mechanisms. The airport, as we mentioned, does have funding streams in place, and um, we can viably look at bite-sized increments to invest and expand our facilities. Um, it also does maintain the current use of the property for now, which allows us to bring in lease revenue, which will offset um, the, the acquisition costs on about a 50% level. Um, it allows us to look at other future commercial opportunities on the, part, uh, on the property. The beauty of this is accomplished with airport funds. There are no local tax dollars associated with this acquisition. Um, and lastly, as we've mentioned before, it is eligible for FAA grant reimbursement. So with that, I would uh, entertain any questions and then seek a uh, council motion on the potential acquisition. Comments from uh, uh, council? Mr. Riccardi just impresses me every time he speaks. <laughs> Great job. Great job. Now, we had seen all of this before, and uh, I don't have any additional comments. I have a question. The, yeah. What's the 96% you, you, the grant from the FAA? What's the probability of receiving that? Very high. <clears throat> we, uh, the, the FAA has a, a program called AIP, Airport Improvement Program. Uh, it's a, a congressionally appropriated fund um, that has been funded in perpetuity for over 30 years. And we have reliably received our, our funding through AIP uh, for as long as I've been at the airport and airports across the country receive this. Really the only potential um, you know, impact that would threaten that funding existence would be um, federal issues in terms of appropriating funds government-wide. So uh, we're familiar with the challenges coming out of Congress in terms of funding. Um, however, the FAA did recently receive a five-year reauthorization bill that does um, better appropriate funds. So we're just subject to annual appropriations of, of those funds. So long story short, I feel very strongly um, about that uh, grant coming in in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, we have never had any issues with those funds uh, becoming available once they're in our programmed and accepted CIP, which they currently are, this project is. And then I have another question. In the other original plan for the 85 million, we had talked about the need for an additional airline, an additional bit plane to be able to mm -hmm. stay overnight. Over time, does this allow us to address that need? It does, indeed. Yeah, it allows us uh, to look at a variety of, of options. If you look at just one of these potential schematics, uh, you can see the blue area is the, the parking apron for mm -hmm. aircraft. Um, you, if you can kind of see the different shades of blue on the left-hand side of the screen, that lighter shade of blue is the existing apron. Um, so what this is depicting is the ultimate expansion uh, of the apron to the north in this case to allow us to accommodate, you can see in this picture, you know, nearly, what was that, eight, nine planes um, at the, the airport terminal facility. So this really allows us, like I said, to leverage our existing infrastructure. So in that case, we're not building a completely new commercial apron, we're just adding on to the apron we have. 
Mm -hmm. uh, much in the same way we'd be potentially assessing renovation and expansion of the existing terminal building, um, as well as adding onto the parking infrastructure we have instead of starting um, on a greenfield site. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, for the renovation of the existing building, how would you do that at the same site? Right, so that will, uh, is not completely vetted out at this point. So once, um, if the land acquisition is to be approved and, and ultimately closed on, we have a scope of work that is in final draft format to essentially revise our terminal area plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a full planning study to vet this out. So these are very much conceptual alternatives here. We'd go through sort of a, a mini process similar to what the master planning process was to reevaluate what the new preferred alternative would be and define that. And it might well be a phased renovation and expansion of the existing terminal, or as these concepts show, it could be the possibility of a new terminal being built next door to the existing terminal while we use the, the existing facilities and we don't interrupt operations in that way. So there's certainly challenges in any way. Those really, what, what that, you know, these two options here depict as alternatives one and two from our master plan, which is renovation of the existing, as well as construction of a brand new next door. That'll really come down to, um, you know, funding availability and, and cost estimates, and that is part of what the, the scope of work we're going to execute um, with an architectural firm to, to work through that process and, and ensure that we have um, a viable CIP we can continue to work through year over year moving forward. Thank Comments? You. But as the council's representative to the airport commission, I can say that, that to answer uh, uh, Councillor Yusuf's question about the likelihood of that, mm -hmm. a, uh, that, that funding Grant. It is uh, what they look at is what they were going to spend on moving the terminal across the, the runway in that 98, $99 million facility versus spending $3.9 million to allow a much uh, cheaper solution in the end mm -hmm. uh, relative to their um, total expenditure. So I think this is a no brainer from their standpoint. So uh, the, most of the discussion that we had at, uh, at the airport commission was around how to do the interim funding, this the gap funding, if you will. And uh, even that we're sitting there going, whatever it is, we'll make it work because it's, you know, when you get 96% of your, of an acquisition of $3.9 million funded, everything else kind of falls to the side. So Amazing. in terms of importance. And so, and we did uh, we want to make sure that the airport fund, we didn't drain it down too much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just don't go out and pay cash for it in the interim and get reimbursed in two years. Let's just make sure that uh, that fund stays stable and that we're, we're not financing that much. And so I think, I think uh, there's been a lot of thought and strategy go into the, the deal. I wish we had deals like this on every facility we could yeah. acquire. And, but you know, the, the, the bottom line is uh, it, it is an unintended consequence of uh, the downturn in the oil and gas industry that allows this opportunity to become available. And uh, that's unfortunate, but I'm really glad to see that the current tenants, you know, that was one of the things too that we just don't want to, you know, we want to allow them to uh, play out their useful life in this facility. So, mm -hmm. and it'll take us that long to, as Tony says, to uh, recreate these plans. Mm -hmm. It does, uh, we're all, we went through the whole master planning process to put the terminal, I made the choice to put the terminal on the other side of the, of the runway. Mm -hmm. Now we have to redo that, that study, mm -hmm. which will be done to uh, cause this to, to end up with the, uh, the idea that this would become our preferred if it becomes our preferred solution. And then that, that is the, the uh, that allows the FAA to continue to fund uh, improvements on this side of the runway. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the ingredients of it. Okay. Uh, Councilor White? Yeah, I just wanted to comment that um, if I remember correctly from the, from the existing master plan, option two was an adjacent terminal and that was significantly cheaper than the just working with renovating the existing one, but obviously that's gonna be looked at again very carefully. Um, if I'm doing my arithmetic right, uh, most of the cost is financing and only a very modest right. piece is the actual prop property acquisition once the grant comes through. Uh, but it's the rental income, as you said, is roughly half of that. Yep. And the other question I had was just simply a, a numerical one. Uh, just my visual estimate, this is about a 40% expansion of the existing uh, of terminal area, mm -hmm. which is huge. Right. 
uh, for, uh, you know, the, the cost is just shockingly low given the benefit. Yeah, I would concur. Well, I would just say this is the best thing to slice bread. <laughs> and just to review for our community, the airport is an enterprise fund. And an enterprise fund means it must pay its own way. And this is exactly what the airport has done. They saved their money, uh, luck fell upon us, and the opportunity is rich. And so um, this is a wonderful opportunity for Durango, the community. I'll just mention that even more so, American Airlines begins flying Chicago and Houston direct flights in June. It is. Yep. American will be initiating uh, Chicago flights, and United will be initiating Chicago and Houston flights starting June 8th. That's Saturday service throughout the summer, with United's uh, service continuing through the end of October. Well, that is really good news. So we have more opportunity in our community to make those direct, direct flights. And again, the Enterprise Fund. This is not funded by a sales tax. It's not funded by a property tax. It's pay your own way. We have other businesses in the city of Durango that we call enterprise funds. And so thank you so much for uh, this presentation. You can tell city council's just all a Twitter here about this new information for our community. And with that, I will look for a motion from council. I'll try. I'll make okay. a motion to direct okay. the city manager to execute a purchase contract with Coinonia properties <laughs> right. LLC on the acquisition of the 12.523 acre parcel and incorporated improvements and approve the attached resolution authorizing the acquisition. Second. Roll call please. Councillor Burke? Yes. Councillor Patine? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. And with that we're going to council actions and reports. Who would like to begin? Well, I just wanted to thank uh, Councillor Brookie for sponsoring, sponsoring our celebration team during Snowdown. Uh, thank you. The mayor and I enjoyed <laughs> ourselves uh, trying to outspell the other competitors, and I think we fared, you know. Round you held your own. Made around four or five. Made around or four, yes. Yeah, so thank you, sir. That was fun. You're welcome. Mayor Pro Tem? Well, I just wanted to congratulate our four city council candidates that are. Um, that have turned in their 25 signatures, correct? <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, to run for city council elections. Jamie McMillan, um, Barbara Noseworthy, Marcos Weisner, and Kim Baxter. Thank congratulations. And the election season will start. Uh, Councilor Berkey? I'm, I'm going to defer because I'm going to be uh, at that airport at 4 o'clock in the morning to flight <laughs> to Los Angeles. Thank you. Uh, Councillor White? Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to mention that uh, I will not be having my office hour Thursday morning. I'm having a medical procedure tomorrow, and I'm not sure exactly my ability to do that. Um, two other things, uh, recent events. The I don't think we mentioned this at our last meeting, but the city has received a SoulSmart Gold Award for uh, improving the ease in permitting for so photovoltaic installations in the city. Uh, I remember having a, seeing a presentation on this at a CML meeting about four years ago, and I was sitting with the city manager, and it's really cool to see uh, the city's participation in this come through. Uh, and the other was last week I attended the transportation forum on uh, January 28th, and this was a very, very interesting panel discussion uh, that had all of the transportation providers from the Plata County, um, which included uh, the Plata Senior Services, the City of Durango, Tr Durango Transit, um, Roadrunner, the two private um, cab companies, and I'm missing somebody. It might have been La Plata County uh, uh, Social Services. Uh, but one of the things I learned is that there are a lot more um, options for low-income people to get around uh, at least if you know if they're handicapped or on Medicaid um, mm -hmm. they can uh, there are a lot of resources available both from um, public facilities and private and uh, it was really encouraging to see all of the agencies in the room talking to one another and uh, I'm hoping that 
I'm, I'm looking over at the assistant manager, who's also the transportation director, and she's smiling. Uh, it's it's very clear um, that there is real potential here for improving our transit situation. Um, it was announced there that we had known that the ex uh, expansion of transit service to the tech center was about to start, but that was the day it began, and a lot of the mem a lot of the people there hadn't known that the, in fact, somebody got up there and said, well, what about getting to the tech center? And he said, you've got it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, th I think if, uh, staff really deserves uh, acknowledgement for the efforts that um, our transit staff has put together to helping make that event happen. Do you have a comment? A, a prompt from my thought about the, on, on Saturday, on my return from Los Angeles, I'll be touring the Panasonic uh, Autonomous Bus Facility in uh, near Stapleton, or near uh, DIA Airport. Um, and uh, that, that'll be the, that tour will be the impetus for my request to uh, that, that uh, to Panasonic to uh, consider Durango as a test pilot community uh, for uh, demonstration of their autonomous bus service. I'm all choked up, council. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm all choked I up. That's why I wanted to mention that before you got off council. Well, so. thank you so much. I'll be sure and stay off the road. You can take your ride. <laughs> I'm not a believer. Um, I've asked the assistant city manager to give us a sales tax and a lodger's tax report. Ms. Blake? Sure. Madam Mayor and council members, we have the November monthly sales tax report for 2018. And in November, the sales tax was up over the prior month by 6.4%. Year to date, it was up 1.4%. Um, and for our lodgers tax in November, it was up down 0.3% um, October to November, and then down 4.8% year to date. We are hoping to have the December sales and use tax numbers, lodgers tax numbers by the 10th of the month so we can um, provide those to you at the next council meeting. Good, thank you very much. Um, I, I have some good news. Uh, every once in a while, the mayor gets a really nice email. Not all the time. But I'm gonna read a portion of an email from a citizen that was complimenting Mike Somson, and he drove truck number 422, a snowplow driver. She said he was observant, he knows the streets, the cars, and he is a problem solver. He cleared the street and made it safer for children to walk to school and for people to get in and out of their homes. Gosh, that just makes my heart feel good. And thank you, Christy Zeller, who wrote that. Um, I also have some news from the bid. I've asked Tim Walsworth to kind of give us an a, a update. He couldn't be here tonight, so he said he wanted to uh, let the community make sure that they knew that there's new businesses openings in Durango. The Roost, Old Barrel Tea Company, Relove Consignment Store, Mac Ranch, and Pine Needle Dry Goods, just to name a few. The Bits Ambassador Program produced 6,000 positive interactions with people visiting the downtown area. The bid will repeat the successful North Main Clean Day and the main event in mid to late April as a way to showcase the North Main businesses. There are new businesses on North Main. Um, they came in in 2018 and 19. The Birds, what's coming? Durango Outdoor Exchange, a new Z is being planned to break ground in the spring. Durango, <coughs> excuse me, art, artisanal foods and the new Durango Chamber, Chamber of Commerce building. Also, the CRC asked me to advertise their diversity dialogue at Saturday, February the 23rd, 9 to 3, at the FLC Union Ballroom. And it's a, a really good event, and they ask you to bring a non-perishable food item um, for the food pantry. They, there is an RSVP in there. On February the 22nd, I'm going to be giving the welcoming at Fort Lewis College to the high school ski state champions. Um, also, there were letters from city council that we sent to our senators Bennett, Gardner, and Congressman Tipton. And we, um, in the letter, hello letters, we talked about the impacts of the shutdown on the federal employees in our region. We have numerous federal employees and businesses that have been impacted and our neighbors as well as Montezuma County. We also sent support to the PUC for the Delta Montrose Electric Association exit from Tri-State. 
uh, we, the city council also sent a letter to Representative McLaughlin uh, encouraging the protection of water quality from the adverse impacts caused by mineral and mining, mineral and mines. Uh, we all know what the Gold King did to the Animus River. So water quality is a, very much of a concern for this city council. Um, we've had a busy night, but I did want to let you know that on February the 21st, there is a meeting at the library at 5.30, sponsored by the planning department, to talk about lot changes in EN1, 2, and 3. EN1 is East Durango, um, North Main going up, uh, Main Street going up. EN2 is uh, West 2nd, West 3rd. EN3 would be in the uh, Animus City. So if you are in, interested to learn more information, show up on February the 21st at the library at 5.30. And with that, we've... May yes, I sir. Interrupt? Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, regarding the water quality to Barbara McLaughlin. Um, on yesterday, I went up to the to Fort Lewis and actually testified in favor of that bill, reporting that I was representing the city council. Hot dog. Uh, and secondly, I believe you didn't say that the purpose of that planning department meeting is concerning minimum lot size for ADUs. Yeah, oh, I forgot the most important word. Accessory dwelling units. If you want to build one, if you have questions about it, this is your opportunity to show up and have your voice heard. Um, I do want to talk about question 1A, which you will see on the April ballot. This is the, and I'm going to read the ballot, it's the authorization to increase city taxes for 10 years for the purpose of funding street improvements. Strictly streets, let's say that again, strictly streets. Shall improve, the city of Durango shall, um, well, shall what is this, Fun funding street improvements, city of Durango taxes be increased not more than Four million six hundred and eighty thousand six hundred eighty-six thousand in the first full fiscal year of collections, and by whatever amounts are generated annually from an additional sales and use tax of not more than 0 0.50 percent, to be imposed beginning July 1st, 2019, for the purposes of funding the construction, failing streets operation and maintenance of streets, alleys, curbs, gutters, sidewalks, and related street improvements, with proposed expenditures being first submitted to a citizen advisory board for a recommendation to city council, provided that these increased taxes shall, be not, shall not be collected after June 30, 2029. And you vote yes and you vote no. If you vote yes, you're gonna see some street improvements, whether it's a small surface, a redo, or a complete construction right down to the sewer pipes. And there is a, there are mail-in ballots, and you start voting on March the 16th. There will be a blue book that will accompany all the ballots. And I think we start receiving those on noon of February the 15th. Um, so, Pay attention, get out there and vote. We have city council elections and also our strictly streets. Uh, it's not property taxes, it's only streets. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you February the 19th. Good night.